Hello, welcome everybody to Noman Art Jam. Uh, my name is Josh Herman. In case you've never been to an art jam before, we're going to hang out today. We're going to make some art. Uh, today, I also have with me uh, Noman founder and CEO Alex Alvarez. Alex, welcome to the hey. stream. Hello, how are you doing? I am good. Good morning. Good. Yes, good morning, everyone. Uh, again, like I said, if you've never been to Noman Art Jam or hung out with us before we're just going to make some stuff today so uh, i will be working in zbrush and i believe alex is going to be in maya maybe making some stuff i don't we didn't really have any specific plans today so we're just going to kind of see no. how this one goes yeah i think just going to uh, sort of play it by ear today yeah it's good and welcome everybody uh hello hello see you all in the chat filing in so good to see everybody um i think i'm going to make a creature today I was debating before the stream, we were talking back and forth, like, do I want to do a project that I've worked on before? I might do that. I'll probably load one up just so I have it, just in case I things aren't going the way I wanted it to. I can pivot uh -huh. always to, the, to something else. And then uh, I might just start from scratch, though, with a creature. So I have this. With it. This is what I was working on last week. Let's see here oh you can't see anything there we go this is the scene i was working on last week kind of getting all these mannequins kind of clayed up which is kind of fun to work on yeah uh so i might work on this or i might just sculpt from a sphere cool what are you thinking uh i'm not sure i think i'm uh i have a lot of things in here i like you know i've got random things on my shelves that i've never used before so mm -hmm. I think uh, maybe I'll just start blocking something out with those. Nice. Um, and we'll see. I'm not not totally 100% sure where I'm going to end up. Yeah, so Alex is in Maya. This is will be his scene uh, mm -hmm. over here, and we'll be swapping back and forth between Alex's and my screens. So if you have any questions on whatever we're working on, feel free to ask those in the chat, and I can switch those around, and we can make sure that you're seeing what For sure. what's interesting or whoever whatever is talking about make that happen uh, and as always in the chat if the, if the volume is too loud or it is too quiet for anybody if there's any issues with the stream just chat and uh, let us know and we'll try to get it sorted out as soon as possible see a couple people in the chat already and also if you guys have any questions in the chat please feel free to ask and we will start you know we're happy to chat about those uh, otherwise we'll probably just be chatting about other things yeah I think I'm just getting things working all right redshift is working that's good and uh all right my chat's working too i see people plopping in there we go volume sounds good awesome all right awesome say hello hi hi our friends <laughs> hello welcome all right i'm gonna get i'm gonna make a sphere i've decided i'm gonna do a creature all right or something make sure my tablet's on the right screen and then I'm going to look at these cliffs I have and maybe start blocking something in with one of those. Nice. Let's see. All right. So you're pulling in just so you've never used these before? I've only used uh, one of them in the scene. So. Mm -hmm. So I figure, you know, I made them, might as well use them for something. I made yeah. them just uh, a while ago when it was just sort of, uh, I was getting into photogrammetry. Mm -hmm. But uh, a lot of these I made in, uh, if you, I don't know if you can read the names, but it's, they say like Indian and Ladder. And so Indian mm -hmm. Canyon is in Palm Springs and Ladder Canyon is near the Salton Sea. Yep. And a uh, really, really cool area that's like a two-hour drive from here yeah salton sea is interesting too it also smells awful oh man but... it smells so bad in the salton <laughs> sea it just smells like dead fish yeah exactly but uh but yeah i went there and the to hike and scanned a bunch of stuff yeah I, I discovered the salton sea years ago i was uh on a road trip with some friends and uh and it was nighttime and we saw on the map this is before like google maps this is when you used the thomas guide you know like a printed map sure. and we just yeah. saw there was this huge lake and uh, we were like oh man i had no idea oh, interesting by palm springs so let's go there and it was nighttime and we found a campground and oh yeah 
and uh, didn't really know what the surrounding area looked like. And then that morning we woke up and it was just like, why is there just crusted salt everywhere on the ground in the campsite? And it smelled like dead fish. And we walked to the shore and just like thousands of dead fish. It's the weirdest thing. It's the weirdest thing. Absolutely. It's very strange. Well, as Alex gets his set up, I'm I'm taking over here. I'm going to take a little sphere, and I'm going to I'm going to start blocking out a head or something. I, don't, I might make a helmet, or I might make a something. I don't know. I'm not totally sure what I'm going to go with. I said creature, but you never know. Let's make some shapes and start pushing things together. I went there a couple of years ago. I mean, I'd say two years ago. That was the first time I've ever been there. I also looked at that place called Paradise Mountain. Mm -hmm. With like the colors all, all on like that concrete e place. I don't remember exactly what it is, but there's like a place over there in the desert as well, which is pretty cool. Where was that? I think it's called. It's over by like. Yukaipa, I feel like it's somewhere in that region. It's like a concrete. Like, I don't know exactly what it is. I'd have to find it again, but it's like a weird area of of this like big art. This feels like an art installation that was going to put there. Uh, we went there, and then we also went to uh, Salton Sea. We didn't stay there. I don't know if I would want to camp there. Uh, you definitely you don't. You didn't know where you were, <laughs> to be fair. but You for sure don't want to camp there. <laughs> yeah, it just smells nasty. Please create, Arf as asking, please create a creature like the Baratoth in Monster Hunter. What is the Baratoth? I don't know. I haven't seen that movie yet. Toss Monster Hunter. Oh, it's like a, a dragon. It's like a dragon with like a chimera sort of mix. Like a, That's cool. Like a lion saber tooth dragon. Okay. Yeah, I can do something like that. That's a fun thing. We'll do like a dragon-y thing. That's a good... Thank you. We'll do a dragon-style creature. We'll start with whatever I have here. Um, somebody's asking, do you use MASH in Maya to model? Uh, I definitely use MASH. MASH is amazing. MASH is awesome. Um, yeah, I used to do instancing with uh, particles. And that uh, was fine because I knew the particle engine in Maya or know the particle engine in Maya very well. But it's very non-intuitive because you have to write a lot of expressions. And then they released XGen, which was supposed to make it easier, but it kind of didn't. I mean, it was a little, you didn't have to write as many expressions, but it was wonky for scattering stuff. Anyway, so MASH came out and uh, MASH is great for instancing. It's super, super simple. You don't really have to write any. It's all sort of node-based. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I definitely use MASH. Uh, do I texture and substance? I don't yet, but I want to learn substance very much. Um, but yeah, no, MASH is cool. Yeah, there's a lot of things. Talking, oh, yeah. What's that? Uh, I was saying like there's a lot of things we've been talking about wanting to learn on real substance. There's a lot of cool things out there to play with. There is an endless amount of stuff to play with, which is cuckoo. But that's what's cool. There's always new stuff coming out. Mm -hmm. So but I need to bend this thing. Somebody's asking, when Nomen started, how many people invested in the idea? It was just me. So crazy enough. But yeah, I didn't, uh, didn't have to. We started really small, so people think that 
you know, they see Noman today as having a big campus and stuff, but Noman was just mm -hmm. one room when I started it. Mm -hmm. So it was one computer lab with 12 computers and a couple offices and a small reception area. So I was able to start that on my own. Um, and then uh, that was a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. I'm going to use a... Can you say what we're creating now? Uh, yeah, I think like we're just kind of both making different things, unless you're asking about other projects. But we're both you know, working on Gnome and stuff, all kinds of different things. But let's see, if not substance, then what's your usual texturing method? Um, I would say really just Maya and Photoshop, ZBrush for painting lots of masks. Um, and uh, but pretty much sort of old school Maya Photoshop texturing. So and as far as 3D paint goes, um, uh, that's when knowing Substance Painter would be useful. But uh, in the past for 3D paint, I've used Mari, and uh, which works really well. Uh, Mari is great though. Yeah. 3D paint is an area that's, you know, had so many tools come out over the years. So like the most popular 3D paint package changes a lot. Yeah. Uh, JD Digital, JD Smith Digital Artist is asking, this is a very important question. Who is your all time favorite SNL cast member? Hmm. That's a good question for me. I think it's going to range. I think one that I wish, obviously this is not trying to go morbid, but Chris Farley was so good. I love the old Chris Farley skits yeah. um, just because he was so animated and so such a, like a great physical performer. I loved him. And then I think for number two with me would also be Will, uh, Will Ferrell. Uh, of Will yeah. Ferrell. Will, Will Ferrell is amazing. All right. I'm blocking out a rough shape here. Farley's up there. Absolutely. I don't know. Uh, JD, who's, who's your favorite? Anybody else in chat? Who's some of your favorite SNL original or, or all-time favorites? There's so many good ones, and it's kind of hard to boil it down to one. Uh, we got another question, uh, which is, would you guys recommend trying to learn Maya before coming to Noman? Uh, Alex, not, you want no, to pick that one? It's not necessary. Yeah, that's not needed. I, I would not. I would focus on trying to get into Noman, and no, and uh, and that's where like the admissions department could give you a lot mm -hmm. of advice on that. Yeah. Um, but knowing Maya is not one of the things we're going to use as a criteria. So it's right. like, meaning that like, if you can get in, then that is the admissions department saying that we feel like, you know, what, you know, you have the potential to succeed. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and so therefore, what do they look at? And they don't really look at your knowledge of 3d software. They look at your knowledge of, you know, composition and design and storytelling and lighting and, um, and drawing and sculpture and like traditional media. So like if you submitted with just a drawing portfolio, you know, like you can get in, you know, but if you submit with just a 3D program, you could get in too if the work is really good. But we kind of see that our role is to sort of teach you the 3D side of stuff. So I, I wouldn't, you play with 3D, sure, just so you understand the concept of what is modeling, what is lighting, what is rendering, what is texturing. Um, but I wouldn't worry too much about it. Yeah, exactly. It's more about fundamental art skills generally and whether you're doing that digitally and in, in 2d and photoshop procreate whatever traditionally you know we've talked to a couple uh grads and artists who've kind of like uh we had i had jared krushevsky on earlier this year and he joined noman without having uh known any 3d he was purely a traditional artist and so that you know he kind of came in and learned it all and there's a lot of other people who have kind of a similar story so you don't have to really even know 3d as all at all but 
it is good to have a good gauge on if it's something you're at least interested in before you, you know, kind of get into a full-time program. Yeah, I think so. Right. I mean, knowing that you like the idea of sitting in front of a computer all day and making stuff, mm -hmm. you know, that's where it's not for everybody, but it's obviously a critical part of working in this industry. But I think our, you know, newer generations, younger generations are very used to being in front of a computer all the time. So, sure. Yeah. Oh, I didn't answer the SNL character. I don't know. <laughs> it's like I haven't really watched it much in a while, but I think uh, I definitely watched it a bit back in the 80s, like Dana Carvey. Oh, Dana, yeah. was pretty awesome. It was great. see got some questions coming in uh farley and norm mcdonald norm mcdonald he was great too um somebody's asking about the kind of blurring the line between creating environments for games and vfx slash animation in terms of workflow because everything or because a lot of game environments are becoming more and more realistic does it like kind of blend it between games and um film i guess is the question i think in some ways it does i think the workflow for creating certain types of assets is it's definitely similar at least like the the core fundamental things you're doing but i think it also really depends on on the size and the scope of the project and what's all being involved and you know if you know the the pipeline for modeling and texturing and you know lighting and rendering and compositing compositing not so much in games but uh it's not going to be crazy different for actually making things but the the quality bar can be a little different i think because you have to do all the optimization stuff for games so oh. that's kind of where it comes in uh somebody's asking if you use paint effects or do you just use speed tree now uh, yeah, I still use paint effects, speed tree for trees, but like little plants, little bushes, things that would only be like maybe, you know, one to two feet tall or smaller, uh, paint mm -hmm. effects is fine because they're not, they, they don't require like a ton of leaves or branches for something tiny. Mm -hmm. But once you need something like heavy, meaning that it's more mature and therefore has potentially hundreds of thousands of leaves and branches, that's where speed trees performance is a lot better and it's just easier to use. Mm -hmm. um, but knowing pain effects is useful if you just need like a little plant in your scene and you don't want to leave Maya, it's very quick to make things like that. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to, let's see, I'm going to tear off a copy of my shot cam and set this okay. to the perspective view. So I've got my shot cam open as like a separate pop out just so I can be working in like the perspective view while still seeing my composition in this window. Mm -hmm. And so, but I'm going to, where'd that go? That's weird. I'm blocking out my uh, creature. So I just, I'm, I'm taking all these little chunks. So I made this rough head shape. Is there. And then I had a sort of a body and some beginnings of some limbs. So I'm just starting to pull this around. And we'll see how it goes. Uh, I've got a little plane in here i'm going to start sculpting on it in maya Ooh, okay do you use the sculpting tools in maya quite a bit uh only for like blocking out general shapes of like a terrain nothing like detailed like zbrush would be used for but they're yeah. really useful like i've got this plane in here for, oh, that's like a ground area that i want to sort of block out shapes for and so if i just mm -hmm. go in here and go to the sculpting tool and then in the sculpting tool, I'm going to set the direction to Y. So polys only go up and down. Mm -hmm. 
because if you set it to normal, which is a default, you're going to get a lot of pinching and a lot of like geometry going through itself. Mm -hmm. So I find it's useful to do that. And then the lower left corner, I've got my <clears throat> shot cam. So like as I'm sculpting in this view, I can see how it's affecting the final sort of right. composition, which I usually would have on a second monitor. Right. Um, so I'm just going to lower the strength down. So yeah, it's like just to be able to be working to my shot cam while sculpting, mm -hmm. I can't do that in ZBrush. Right. You know, and so ZBrush, when it comes to perspective is, uh, and a 3D camera is pretty wonky, you know, because mm -hmm. it's not really a true OpenGL generated 3D camera. So, right. So if I'm working where I'm like really want to just stick to working to camera, that's where it's useful to just do it in here. And then like any detail that would be on the ground inside here would just be done via displacement maps, which could be from ZBrush. Mm -hmm. You know, but I didn't need to do much on this ground plane other than just give it a little bit of, you know. some shape just some variance just some it's not a plane really right makes sense and then i've got another one back here which i'll do the same thing on Do we know what kind of softwares are used to create visual effects in Hollywood movies? Sure, there's a couple big ones. The probably the number one that we teach at Maya and, or teach at Noman uh, is Maya, and that's the big, you know, program that a lot of studios build their their pipelines on. So that's a kind of an all-encompassing 3D software, um, kind of like a hub. And so that one is going to be able to model and texture and do really anything that you want. And so the a big bulk of like our classes specifically at Nomen teach Maya, but that's because it's huge in the industry. Uh, other ones, depending on what you're interested in, whether it's texturing or modeling, there's a lot of specific applications that are really good at what they do. So for example, while uh, Alex is sculpting here in Maya, I'm working here in ZBrush, which is a digital sculpting package. And um, that one is a uh, that one is kind of a digital sculpting package, so you're going to be able to sculpt organically and create more, you know, multi-million polygon meshes that can have really high detail and you know can do all kinds of different things on them. So uh, then there's Substance Painter, there's uh, Houdini, there's I'm trying to think of other ones off the top of my head. Compositing softwares like Nuke, um, all all different kinds of things. That are going to be used in the in the industry. Uh, kind of tangential question off that is 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 Blender uh, becoming is it industry standard or is it becoming industry standard? That's a good question. We get this question quite a bit because it, it it's a great beginner software and it has a lot of really cool things in it. Uh, the short answer is not really. It's not really industry standard in the way of is a big budget movie is a big game using it as their as kind of like their number one piece of software that everything's attaching to and that's just because it's 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 great it's especially in the past couple of years it's done a lot of really cool things um but it's not quite acting as a hub i would say yeah i think uh blender is you know great if you want to get started with 3d because it's free and it can do a ton it's a powerful program there's some really cool stuff mm -hmm. being done with it but uh you know th this came up last week also and basically mm -hmm. you want to look at the industry and so and where you want to work so if you want to work at blizzard or ilm or weta or pixar or disney or dreamworks or the mill or at method or mpc you want to find out what software they're using you know, and what you'll find is for most of those places, they're going to expect uh, Maya as your core 3D package because their pipelines are based around it. And these are pipelines that have been built over the last, you know, 20 years, 10 years. Um, and so they'll expect you to know Maya because that's their core hub software. You know, but if you're an effects artist, they might want you to also know Houdini. If you're a modeler, they might also want you to know ZBrush. Um, but obviously, like if you're a professional modeler working at a place like Blizzard and Blender has some cool modeling tools, they're not going to care if you jump over to Blender to model something. 
but you're still going to need to be able to get it into Maya. Yeah. Yeah, at the end of the project, it's all going to have to be kind of filtered in there. So it's, it's just kind of nice because it means that, like, you know, the whatever the specialty programs are, they still have their split their place and they can still be used. But um, we see a lot of that happening, especially in, you know, the concept art scene. Mm -hmm. A lot of 3D concept art artists are bringing in and using Blender because it's got a lot of really great tools in it. Um, so I think it's it's really cool, and there's a lot of really great stuff happening in there for sure. Yeah, I mean, it's the awesome thing is you know you're, there's some cool development going up with, on with Blender that hopefully it causes you know the bigger software companies to pay attention and and listen and and improve their tools. So competition is critical. Mm -hmm. You know, back in the day when you know ZBrush was popular, you know Mudbox popped on the scene. And it, mm -hmm. it definitely bothered, you know, the, the Pixelogic guys. It, it made them realize, like, all right, we need to uh, not rest on our laurels over here. And they started adding craziness to ZBrush really fast mm -hmm. and just leapfrogged uh, Mudbox oh, over the course I mean, of a couple yeah. of years. Yeah. Um, I remember when it was like, oh, this is cool. Yeah, they just destroyed a... them, <laughs> to be honest. Yeah, oh, it was totally, like, oh, crap. Completely. So yeah, I don't know anybody who still uses Mudbox. I know Miguel and Tran still use it a little bit, but I think I they've think, been starting uh, to switch over from what I remember. Ian, Sp Ian Spriggs. I feel like he's a Mudbox sculptor. But I think that's, you know, that is more just like people's habits, you know. Mm. But ultimately, if there's another piece of software that pops out, pops up that makes something easier, you know, like I was showing that, you know, Embergen yesterday, Oh, yeah. Where for, for simple effects, it's going to clearly make certain types of things a lot easier to do. Then, like, why not? Why not do that then? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what was first course at Nomen structured on? First meaning when we opened, Maya was uh, a power animator based school. Maya wasn't out yet when we uh, opened Maya or when we opened Nomen. And okay. so I was. Uh, working at Alias Wavefront. So I was using Maya since Alpha 2, like pre-release. So I've been using Maya for a really long time. Um, but yeah, Power Animator is the software that preceded Maya. And then Power Animator, the software company that made Power Animator was merged with a company called Wavefront that made Advanced Visualizer and Explore and Dynamation and Kinemation. And then they merged all of their different tools into a new program called Maya, which is... So yes, we started with Power Animator, would effects classes and then uh, added Maya in 98 mm. and then tons of tools since I think we have what 150 different tools installed on each workstation at Nomen. Oh, it's a lot. Yeah, it's a lot. Yeah, it's it's there's so many specialty tools and plus, you know, it's like something like X normal, you know, like that's your mm -hmm. Ivy gen like those are specialized little tools that do specific things, but those count. Yeah. And they're all really good at certain things. Like I remember, you know, even Hedis, Hedis UV was really big for a while. And mm -hmm. you know, individual small packages that do something really good that somebody, another package doesn't do or doesn't, you know, hasn't developed. And so, yeah. Got some, a bunch of questions it sounds like about, um, best way to create photorealistic textures and animation. Oh, that's interesting what the best software is for that. That's going to be a hard one because it's going to range between so many different things. Like if you're looking about textures, probably the best way to get photorealistic textures is do photogrammetry. And that's what you can see with like the all the mega scans and you you did a big talk a couple of years ago on photogrammetry as as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, well, um, I mean photorealism is uh you know, if you're doing photorealistic texturing, then you starting as photos as a base. To, base is what a lot of people do. So having a you know a big library of, of photographic textures that can be blended together and painted together, you know, are going to give you all of that high frequency detail that would take forever to paint by hand. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so I think that, uh, and then yeah, photogrammetry is a good way to to build texture libraries. And so like the Megascans library of textures. <clears throat> is photogrammetry based or scan based? 
and knowing how to do that yourself is really useful. Yeah. Any ideas how big the industry in Germany is? Uh, I don't know. I, I worked at Cloud Imperium for a couple of years, and they have a games office in Frankfurt. I know that some of there is some game offices there. I think um, Fry Tech used to be there, and I think what's that other? There's a big company there. Uh, they do mobile games. I think Wuga. Google is a big game company that's in Germany, but I don't know about on the visual effects side. Yeah, I don't know off the top of my head. I mean, there are thousands of visual effects studios around the world. Mm -hmm. And games and indie game studios, there's so many. I think it's... <clears throat> so yeah. many people come to Noman wanting to work at ILM, you know, or Blizzard, you know, because they only know like the big 10 places for good reason. Sure. But there are so many places out there that do cool work. You know, like you don't have to be at ILM to work on a, you know, big budget feature or at Blizzard to work on a cool game. Mm -hmm. You know, these days you look at the credits and you often see lots of studios that you've never heard of before that might be, you know, under 50 people. And it's a very different vibe to work at a smaller studio than a big one, which some people prefer. Absolutely. You know, the thing with working at a big studio is you're <clears throat> more likely going to have to specialize. And if you like doing a little bit of everything, modeling, texturing, lighting, rendering, the smaller the studio, the more likely they'll let you do more than just one thing. Yeah. Uh, somebody's asking, is it necessary to know how to draw to become a successful CG artist? Uh, short answer, no. Uh, it's not a requirement to be able to draw. Uh, it is something we look for in Noma portfolios. Doesn't you know some your kind of what I guess I would call analog artistic abilities is something we look for. But it's not really a requirement to you know. I know a lot of people who can't draw. I can't draw terribly well. Um, I see things better in 3D space. So uh, it's just a little easier for me to view things that way. And so as soon as I kind of got into 3D and sculpting, uh, that's where I I stayed. So no, you don't have to be a, a great 2D artist to be a good 3D artist. The skills yeah, do there's, translate. There's though. a lot of people that are in the industry that don't necessarily draw. So... I think it depends what you're doing also, you know, like if you want to be a, a character artist or a character modeler, then often people who have been drawing or sculpting characters since they were kids are the ones that tend to do the best with that. Mm -hmm. But, uh, but some people really don't click with drawing, you know, like, you know, I mean, there are a lot of sculptors out there, like traditional sculptors who just learned how to sculpt and never drew and are amazing. Mm -hmm. So I definitely wouldn't worry about, you know, like if you're intimidated by shading and perspective and all that stuff, like, but you want to be a modeler, like pick up ZBrush and try sculpting. Yeah, exactly. I see that you are uh, manipulating your plane around. So you're kind of getting some more stuff in the background, it looks like. Mm -hmm. Are you sculpting in the viewport or are you sculpting in the... The big, the big window, I guess. Um, I'm just sculpting. Because you can well, manipulate in, in, in the little one. Uh, well, this is, I mean, they're both just perspective windows. So I could, I could. Oh, okay. both of them. You could. Uh, Arf Prince, yeah, you can name this creature if you like. I mean, I'm going to see what it, see what your names are, but I feel pretty good about it. Yeah. Go ahead and let's pitch me some names. We'll see what we'll see what we come up with, or we'll do uh, we we'll do this before in some other streams coming up with names by as the chat comes up with some interesting things as well. When we I'll work on mine for a little bit and I'll hop back over, and then we'll see where it's going. Right now it's in a very rudimentary stage, so 
very comfortable making heads and creatures and things like that uh, that are more bipedal. So I think I, I'm choosing something I'm not as comfortable with, which I'm actually okay with, but uh, going a little slower than I'm used to. Soon though. So you pulled in, it looks like three photogrammetry pieces. One, two, three. And then you've kind of pulled four. these planes in. Four? Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because then... if I need something that's a specific shape, then, you know, to fill a specific area, then I'm going to need to make that from scratch and then just texture mm -hmm. it. And so with these little planes that are in here, then just going to bridge and grabbing some, you know, cool shaders from mega scans would be one way to approach it um so yeah right now it's just sort of thinking about composition as opposed to textures or lighting just where things are going and i think i probably should kind of like something in here basics. a scale reference yeah hmm. so i'm gonna need to bring one of these little dudes in here and you know what i need to do i need to save oh good call i should do that too <laughs> <laughs> Nothing like being like, oh, this is, I'm enjoying how this is going and then uh, having it all disappear on you instantly. Uh, yeah, let's save. I'm going to just see what's the date before. I'm uh, adding some, some scapulas to my creature right now to get this going. I did this in a previous stream as well, but I'm bringing in these really large blocks that I'm kind of putting together, and then I'll, I'll spend a little bit more time than this, and I'll, I'll mostly focus on silhouette. This is not a great silhouette right now, so I need to work on that. Um, but I'm trying to get all these big pieces in play to make sure that this creature could be more interesting, I think. It is. What was it called? Or how did they do this one? Uh, this is so there's always a difference for me between like the dragons some dragons and i think there's a, it's a technical term of a worm versus a dragon meaning like i think a, a dragon or one of them is different meaning like they have four legs and then wings or sometimes they have four legs of which the wings are attached to like a bat they their front arms like this so i guess i should be doing this one if that was the the brief All right, I should, but yeah, I want to make it kind of feel somewhat like I kind of like this image here. It's kind of nice. They're wyverns. I see somebody saying wyverns. What is it, chat? If anybody knows the difference between a worm, not O R M, but Y R M, and a dragon, what is the difference between those two things? Did you get your scale person in? Uh, yeah, not sure on the scale yet, but uh, oh, there they I've are. got somebody in there. Yeah, just her. Worms generally have two front legs, no back legs, and wings. Ah, thank you. Dragon usually has four legs, eastern versus western, may or may not have wings. Is there a difference between the dragons that have wings like with four legs? I guess that's a question. Like, okay, so if we have like this one, there's like this type. There's let's quickly mock it up so you I can explain. But there's the one where the wing kind of comes off of this part. This is like what I remember from like uh like Reign of Fire is this type of again. There's the other type, which is this type. This is like, uh, I think this is more like Pete. Pete's Dragon is kind of more like this. I like this one, though. What are the ones that like Blizzard? What do they look like? 
I think they're attached to their front legs. Looking for my art book. Avatar creature. It does look kind of like the some of the avatar creatures. I just moved all my art books down here and I'm not seeing my blizzard one. It might be upstairs still. Some people say that if the wings are attached to an arm, that would be a wyvern. Okay. Good to know. Oh, I like your uh, lighting direction coming through there. Yeah, just uh, trying to figure out lighting that allows me to get her to actually not disappear. Mm -hmm. But she's also wearing black, so that's uh, there's an issue with that model. <laughs> oh, is it just like not showing up? Well, you can see her. She's just tiny, but I think that's at least enough. Yeah, I just want to get mm -hmm. like because once I have my lighting, then I'll probably lock it just so that anything I add from this point forward is you know I know that this area is going to be in the dark, so I don't need to worry as much about the textures on that as something that's going to be in full sunlight. Mm -hmm. So now is a good time to think about that, I guess. I'll look over at chat, see what's going on there. What happened to Mental Ray, though? It died. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what, what did happen to Mental Ray? Did it just get taken over? Uh, I think, didn't NVIDIA buy it? Because of Iray. I have no idea. And uh, oh, yeah, okay. they, killed, they killed it, yeah. They killed it. I think, you know, it's, I mean, it was around a long time. I believe the first movie that used Mental Ray was City of the Lost Children, that Janae and Caro movie that had that green smoke that was flying around. And that was rendered right. in Mental Ray. And I remember that being a thing. Okay. And, uh, and it was a great render. It was amazing for doing natural environments, you know, for rendering. Mm -hmm. You know, millions of polygons had really, really nice uh, subsurface and translucency shaders. It was slow, though. That was the problem. I remember it being very slow. Yeah. Yes. Very slow. <laughs> okay. So I am going to set a keyframe on my light, and I'm going to select my shot camera and set a keyframe on that. That's how I don't lose my camera or a light position. Mm -hmm. Then I've got this little vertical right there that's a little annoying to me. So I put a lattice on this cliff thing on the right. So that means I can still grab some of those lattice points and scoot them around, but this lattice doesn't have enough density. So I am going to delete history on that. And I'm now going to add another lattice to it. So let's go to animation, deformers, lattice. And then on the lattice, I'm going to increase how many divisions it has. But I need to go to another view to figure out if it's positioned the way I need it to be. Yeah, if you've got a lattice on a piece of geometry in Maya, if you select the lattice and the base together, you can reposition the lattice without affecting the geometry, just so the lattice grid is matrix is kind of where you want it to be, which is really nice. And then I'm going to increase the divisions on that even further. No, that's too many.
And so now you can see in the render view window, I'm just messing with that cliff there. You can see if I move it, how it's updating. Mm -hmm. yeah. Like this is the kind of stuff that's just useful to do in my at a camera. Cause like if I was in ZBrush and sculpting mm -hmm. on this, I'd had no idea like what I'm affecting from the camera's point of view. Yeah, yeah absolutely. So I definitely recommend to anybody who's learning Maya to, as a modeler, to like learn all the deformers. Hmm. Uh, yeah, they're, they're very powerful. I think that they kind of get, you know, especially with all the other digital sculpting packages and tools and ways to do like big manipulation like that. Mm -hmm. I think they kind of get swept under the radar because it's, you know, there's other ways to do that that are, you know, more sexy or whatever, but they're super powerful especially when you're using something that's got full textures on it and it's like already in the scene like they're really really powerful definitely don't forget that they, they're a good tool you can use deviant hermit is going to remind us to save unless Thank they you. fall asleep well yeah yeah i hope <laughs> this is you know watching people make stuff in real time isn't necessarily the most exciting thing in the world so hopefully it's not always. We're talking about but this uh, before our stream. Yeah, Pop hopefully in. it's. But I, I kind of want to do like a long-term project. Yeah, and people could kind of come back in and and chime in and see how it's looking and and I think there's something to watching people work real time that that makes it so it's it's real. It's not you know a sped up time lapse. It's ten seconds long and doesn't really talk about it. I think it's the things I've learned the most from have been real time, whether it's a demo or whether it's a, a workshop, a tutorial. Mm -hmm. Those are the ones that I learned the, mo the most from hands on, any of that stuff. are you in uh where do you live are you you're saying if you fall asleep are you in like in the u.s are you in another location i'm doing you're doing a little fog pass which is cool yeah i'm just gonna try and get a little in here Somebody's asking, is there anything like the curve brush in Maya? You're modeling a chain of motorcycle and you want to spin it around two gears. Uh, yeah, you, there's a animate, what's it called? Spice spline. Um, mm -hmm. We just talked about this yesterday. It's called the animated snapshot tool. Is that correct? I think. Mm -hmm. And that's what you would want to use. So you can create a, a series of, of pieces of geometry based on you know, the the path that you want it to control. And you can also animate that too, so it can be animated. I just added some fog oh, it's, in the oh, scene. It's almost, almost three in the morning where you're at. That makes oh, sense really? then. <laughs> okay. So it's, it's not because we're boring. <laughs> Maybe it's a I'll take bit. that safe for anyways, yeah. <laughs> doing a I took all my my Z tools and I merged them together and I'm, I'm trying to do like a proportional pass so this is what it looked like before of like kind of oh that's a star and I'm pushing all this stuff after after I get this done I'll save it but I'm basically focusing on the areas I want to focus on and trying to combine this all together and push as far as I can to make it look a little more appealing Get that out in a minute. This neck is giving me troubles. So, are you looking for textures? 
when you're going into mm-hmm. bridge. So uh, you're just yeah. Gonna, are you exploring, or do you have like a specific thing that you're looking for? Uh, well, in Maya, I've got uh, this near ground, and so mm-hmm. which is the lower left corner of the image. So I need to get a texture on that, and so I'm just going to browse bridge to find something that'll work with that. And so I'm just going to look uh, around surfaces. Yeah, like I was saying last week, I mean, they've been adding so many things in here. It's crazy, Mm -hmm. which is awesome. Yeah, it's super cool. What is my opinion uh, of the art community on Twitter? I don't use Twitter. I don't either, but I've noticed it's become more popular than uh, than it has been in a while. I think, and I think that's pretty cool that there's, there's like this other avenue. I've seen a lot of people, you know, start to bail on Facebook or you know only use Instagram or whatever. So Twitter's an interesting one for me. Yeah, I inst- I uninstalled Facebook during the election. Oh yeah, that's right, a good call. deal. Yeah, it's like yeah, I go to Facebook and just a wall of people bitching, and I, I you know go to Instagram. I just follow artists, and so it's just like oh mm-hmm. a, you know a stream of people sharing art, and that put me in a better headspace. Then so yeah, yeah, I, I've been using Facebook less and less, but Twitter seems like a, a rabbit hole I don't need to fall into. <laughs> V-Ray has GI on by default, but still gets incredibly fast IPR. I mean, how far software up I know. It's true. It's whether it's V-Ray, Redshift, Octane, all the GPU renders, you know, it's amazing uh, how fast we're able to calculate GI and ray tracing now. It's so awesome. Mm-hmm. working it's better than it was would you say instagram has the strongest art community i think so uh i think it's just because it's a purely visual medium right so it's every everything on there is is kind of lends itself to being art friendly uh i think the only challenge that i see it it doesn't have harder to I think create like an actual community more of just like it feels more passive to me but maybe that's just the way I'm using it so thin try to align it a little bit with the arms i'll eventually integrate it better but this is all kind of from a sphere today and i'm not super i'm comfortable but not as familiar with um anatomy so i'm having to kind of make make some of it up and reference 
we get your opinion on the Twitch art community. I think the Twitch art community is definitely growing. Uh, I've seen it over the past you know year years begin to grow, especially as you know for even I think pre pandemic the the just chatting and the IRLs and the the art communities were much much smaller. So I think that this you know the online the forced online interaction is helped the Twitch art community significantly. Um, it's cool. I like it. I like it because it's for me. It's more interactive. You can chat with people both as the streamer or the viewer, and um, kind of gives you. I don't know. It just gives you like a nice different type of a thing. Uh, sort of, Alex. Yeah, it sort of is. Uh, this was the a, a Baratoth, I think, is what it was called. Barioth. Uh, from Monster Hunter, and so somebody recommended this. So I'm kind of looking at this and seeing, it's just kind of doing a version of that. So it does kind of look Quetzalcoatl like. With uh, I think Quetzalcoatl has very small legs uh, or different back, but I guess it's similar. So I'm riffing off this. Which remind me. Reminding me of Rain of Fire. I really liked Rain of Fire. That was a good movie. Easter eggs. Christian Bale in that. And Matthew McConaughey. Yeah, that's right. Bald. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> These dragon. Let's see if we get a good one. Yeah. You can see some of the uh, sculpts. This is a really great one. This is a really beautiful uh, maquette they made for this. Just showing the whole. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. That dragon was amazing. That's right. Really cool sculptures for these, and really, really good fire for the time. Mm -hmm. I think I was googling it. it. Came out in two thousand two. So for at the time, yeah, huge. This is kind of the kind of what we're looking at here too. So this is kind of the vibe that we're going to go for today. I don't know if I'm going to do all all this, even though it would be cool. Um, but yeah. Super cool stuff. So that's kind of where you see what we're going for here. Looks like you are getting some textures in. Mm -hmm. So you pick uh, pick some from Bridge or some from Bridge, which I may, you know, swap. I'm just trying to get something in here. Mm -hmm. And uh, so now I'm just going to graph it. And the nice thing from Bridge is that you know it comes in with your with the material for Redshift. So whatever renderer you're set to in Maya, it'll make the material for that renderer, which is great. Mm -hmm. And the other thing that's nice, that's smart about it, is that it shares the same place 2D node for all of the textures. Mm -hmm. um, so that if you want to change the repeats on your surface, you only have to change one node. Right. And it'll change the repeats for the albedo, the AO, the normal, the displacement all together. Cool. Makes it easy. Makes it a lot easier, yeah. You just kind of focus on the, the fun part. This channel moderation prohibits longer comments. Uh, I think there is a issue. We don't allow links in our comments. And then I don't know about specifically longer comments, but there might be a character cap in general. I don't know. I'm looking at this Reign of Fire Dragon, I'm like, oh, I just kind of want to make that. This is really cool. What do they do? I kind of like looking at these as like sometimes just studies. What is somebody else doing that makes it like a, you know, like a master copy style thing? Like what is it happening that makes it really cool looking? D 
Do you think 3D art is more about art or mathematics and rules? Art. Uh, art. Art, 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 yeah. Yeah, 100% art. Yeah, back in the 80s and 90s, uh, the tools were uh, a lot more limited. Uh, there was a lot more scripting involved, so ma a math background was more important in the early days of 3D. But uh, these days, uh, if you're unless you're an effects artist, you know, or a rigger, you don't really need to worry too much about that stuff. As far as math, yeah, absolutely. I think it's kind of you know. I think most people, it's easy to get confused, but it's most people expect it to be far more technical than I think it is. Once you get into it, it's even like learning Maya. It's you're moving you're creating a box and you're moving a box around it's not like you're inputting math and rules to make any of these objects you know not at all yeah for sure and then like you know you see alex is kind of looking through materials and is working more on composition and is working more on uh lighting and that's all art and i'm working on sculpting which is about you know, creating and shaping forms rather than it is, you know, I, I'm not even thinking about art or math, excuse me, in any way with this. Um, so definitely, 3D art is far more artistic than I think some people think it is. And I think that's, again, like you were saying, like the older styles of it, especially mm -hmm. like looking at older movies. Somebody had to like make something in the computer and it was, you know, kind of, much much older uh very different very very different than where we are right now which is great like from an artistic standpoint you know, teaching to be, you can teach somebody with a good arts background 3d like no problem uh mm -hmm. it's just getting them understanding that it's you can still be creative right? and that it's it can be fun and it can be creative even if you're working if you love to draw, you can draw digitally. If you love to sculpt, you can sculpt digitally. And it, to me, it, it just expands your, what you can do rather than limiting you to you know, working in a computer. It's not actually limiting at all. Uh, Unity versus Unreal, which is the best for game visual effects? It's a hard question to answer. I know Unity just went public a couple months ago. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. I think there could be some interesting things on the horizon with them. Yeah, for sure, I because they raise a lot of I would expect there will be. Yeah, a lot. Yeah. Um, currently, I think most people would pick Unreal. And that's because Unreal is showing off a lot of new tools, and they have they have a good amount of money as well. So they've been investing in their tools and creators and adding new things all the time. So currently, I think the average choice is going to be Unreal. But I would I wouldn't sleep on Unity at all. A couple questions here. Let's see. I'll kind of try to get through these, Alex, while you're looking at your screen. We'll see what you're working on. It looks like you're setting up some textures. Um, we'll go just through the... We talked about this earlier in the stream. Uh, we also have many uh, other YouTube videos about this. So if you're interested in portfolios for Nomen, admission portfolios for Nomen, uh, you can check those out. We actually, on our YouTube channel, we have some that are specifically tips and tricks for portfolios. So go look, take a look at those. Uh, but to answer your question shortly, uh, you are not required to have a few number of traditional pieces uh, and a huge number of 3D pieces. There's not really a requirement to what's needed in your admissions portfolio at all. Uh, what we actually do is we have a really unique admissions process where you can uh, speak one-on-one -on -one with our admissions counselors and they'll actually give you por portfolio advice. So if you are interested in applying to a program or just kind of seeing uh, where you, you know, how you're doing or anything like that, uh, the, honestly, the best thing to do is just reach out to the admissions team, schedule a meeting with them and just kind of start working through it that way because um, they'll, they'll give you advice. But yeah, if you want more information on that, there's there's several YouTube videos where our admissions director talks through that. 
uh, or again, just reach out to them and they're happy to, to get in a meeting with you. Uh, let's see what kind of questions we got here. What's the idea behind Retopo? After an already built character, can I delete and build problem areas and reconstruct with ZModeler instead? Uh, you can do that quickly if you're going to be re sculpting something in ZBrush. But Retopo, especially for characters that are going to be in production, like if you're going to be making something for a production that's going to be animated, you will almost guaranteed have to retopologize it because it needs to be animated, it needs to be rigged, it needs to work within the, the production. Sometimes you'll have a single, like for characters specifically, uh, you'll have a single base mesh that all characters will use, for example. So there won't be, you, you will have to make sure that it works with other uh, uh, with all the other characters, and that's there's kind of restrictions in that when you get into the production side of things. Um, is there such a position at major companies of artistic consultant that you know of? I don't know about artistic consultant. Um, I think maybe you're thinking about an art director position. There is definitely art director positions that you could take a look at. They're more high level positions. Uh, can you, somebody's asking, what's the role of poly count? What's the difference between VFX to games? Uh, the, the big difference is that that poly counts, the reason that the, the poly counts exist or there is a difference in, in between games and film is games have to run real time. So that's really the difference, meaning you have to render uh, you know, 30, 60, 120 frames second, uh, whereas in, in a film it's pre-rendered so you don't you know you could your renders could take hours per frame um uh, and sometimes two so that's the big difference and that's why poly count and texture size uh, is a thing uh one last question well there's two i guess is in, in vfx the vfx visual effects is more technical than the other disciplines yes that is correct uh, doing dynamics and simulations and explosions and uh, is a more technical side to it for sure. Uh, and then the last question is, looks like you're asking some ZBrush questions here. I'll try to get something ready for it to look at. Um, one second, you're asking about workflow to manage the geometry of problems you don't know when to apply subdivisions meaning when you just stop dynamesh and start with dynamesh yeah of course uh i'll show you that really quickly so I'll take over here if i'm sculpting something i'll load up uh just something different for example Let's see what we can find. I think I have a planes of the head model. So when do you want to be dynameshing and when do you not want to be dynameshing? Uh, if you're continuously changing the big shapes, like if I'm taking horns or whatever I'm doing to this, using the classic snake brush example, you know, where I'm just going to create shapes on this model. But now that geometry is really messed up, here's where I would dynamesh and, and do this. But at a certain point, you don't need to continue to add right to this shape. And you're you're more resolved. So if I were to dynamesh this and I'm saying this is you know essentially my base mesh, this is my new base mesh, and I'm, I'm happy with how this is looking, right? Then I would probably at this either retopologize it or I would go into something that's a little bit more um, what a final mesh for this could look like and and there's a couple reasons you would do this one is either going to be just because you are um going to be texturing it meaning if you want to do uvs it'll be a lot easier to do uvs on a nicely laid out mesh if you're going to bring this down a pipeline and you want to animate the face uh having a nice retopologized face is going to be better than than not um, and there's, there's several other reasons, but that's kind of what you want to do. So when you kind of get your base mesh completed, there's no reason to have your Dynamesh up here. So this is where you might duplicate. So if you're here, I would duplicate this. I would go into our geometry tab and I might, I'll just make a quick one. So I'll uh, go to Z Remesher 
I'll just see remesh this real quick. It shouldn't take too long. As I say that, it takes longer than I expected it to. And there we go. So I have this mesh now, which kind of is capturing the bulk of the information of what we had in our, in our red one here. Now I can take this one and I can either uh, project my details onto it of what I had. I could project it, or I could just start sculpting from this. If I'm using it as a base mesh, I often like to just start sculpting again. Maybe do a quick reproject. Dynamesh is great for creating your base mesh, but it's not something that you necessarily need to do to create a final sculpture out of it. Some people do, but it sometimes to me it's honestly a little bit more more work than is really needed. Uh, to keep it in that form. You're not gaining a lot, in my opinion, once you're at a certain point. You're just working with a really high polygon mesh for kind of no reason. Yeah, that is why that is done. Uh, art director be focused to a project? Yes, correct. There, there are studio art directors. There are other art directors and creative directors that are general high level. Um, but there's not really an art consultant unless you're, usually consultants don't work for the company. Let's see. All right. Alex, how's your setup going over there? It's going. Um, let's see. I'm going to try playing with MASH a little bit. So I imported just a bunch of random rocks, like little ones. Okay. And so now yeah. I've created a MASH network. So I'm just checking the instancer node. So it goes from 0 to 30. So I have 31 little rocks in here. So my placer node, I'm going to tell it to go 0 to 30. So it's going to randomly place these 30 rocks. And then I think I'm also going to add a random node and just tell it to randomize the rotations on these rocks. And then now I'm just going to test the node to see if it works. So with MASH, by creating a placer node, that's kind of like, there used to be a script called SP Paint, that still exists, which was like a mm -hmm. painter script that allowed you to paint geometry. Um, and so with MASH, the equivalent is the placer node. And so now that I've specified these objects, then if I click on Add, then you can see it's uh, painting these rocks. And so oh, cool. since I have 30 rocks, it's randomly picking from my list of 30 rocks as I paint. And so I'm going to undo that and I'm going to increase, I'm going to turn on scatter. And then just sort of uh, figure out the setting I want for that. And then uh, I'm just going to get some rocks in here. And are you trying to put the rocks in to make it like to, to fill the scene? Often I see like, especially environment artists do that, like where two pieces meet. Yeah, it's like to, you know, go in here and just, uh, you know, like along the edges there. It breaks also breaks up the texture that you might have on a surface. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, with, you know, unless you have like uh, vector displacements that have undercuts, a regular displacement is not going to have undercuts. And so that's going to sort of uh, limit the contrast within a texture. And so having actual geometry inside the scene is going to add sort of things you're expecting to see, which is the fact that in a natural environment like this, there really would be lots of rocks and things all over the place. Mm -hmm. Deviant Hermit uh, is reminding us to save. <laughs> 
I just saved before making mash, or the mash node. Oh, somebody's tuning in from Kenya. Hello. Hello from Kenya. Hello from Los Angeles. <laughs> I ended up removing the head that I put on there, and I kind of went more bird-like. I kind of like this direction more than I was going. It's like... I'm going to go that way. Oh, that's looking cool. All right. So I had this little thing on there. I mean, this reminded me of like a, a fighter pilot version. <laughs> There's like a little helmet on there. We'll get rid of that. All right. I think I'm getting close to being able to like really start on the, the overall shapes. Like I've got them in my big primary shapes, but... I need to kind of tie it in, figure out what my actual like forms are. Some of these big things are leading to some mess in here. So I gotta work on that. And often I'll see like if I'm working uh, from like a sphere. I can usually get something like my process is I, I tend to find something that's in the long run maybe more interesting, but I because I'm not like working through a base mesh, but it takes a lot longer. I think it's just like kind of the concept of creating something from scratch though. And then I also have to work through a lot more problems uh, within the design. So like right now, like there's a lot of anatomy problems that I, I eventually would want to fix here. And so that's something I need to address at some point. But uh, I'm not going to do that all today. Somebody says they're working on their art portfolio to to try to apply to Nomen. That's awesome. Cool. Make sure to reach out to our admissions team. I know we've already said that a bunch in the stream. You probably already heard it, but uh, it's the best place to get some feedback for it. So make sure you reach out and uh, keep it up. Best of luck. I feel like this arm is way too... Do industries like Disney, Universal, Marvel, Sony, etc., have their own VFX software? For uh, sure. Those ones, yeah, they're all going to have their own stuff of some kind. Uh, what you're kind of talking about is proprietary software. So, it, you know, usually that's made for or it's created by those companies. So that they can kind of control and do whatever they need to do for their own projects, especially if they have the budget. Uh, they will, they'll, you'll see some of the bigger companies make their own stuff. This wing piece. Yeah, all major studios have proprietary software because they're they often you know, just need to create an effect that either isn't easy to accomplish with tools that already exist, or there's a way to improve efficiency. Um, it was very, very common back in the day. So a lot of tools that are off the shelf now, like Nuke and Massive, 
uh, and Mari were created by studios as their internal software. Mm -hmm. Like Nuke was Digital Domain's internal compositing package. Um, Massive was developed, I believe, in conjunction with Weta for Lord of the Rings. And, uh, and so those are examples of internal tools that studios built to uh, just get done what they needed to do in a manner that they felt was better than off-the-shelf software. And uh, MASH, uh, also something that was developed at a studio. X-Gen was developed by Disney. Render Man, obviously, by Pixar. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just over time, they've gotten to be, either they've released them or, you know, they've, well, they had to release them, but work with other studios, work with Autodesk, work with somebody else to implement it. iClone came from Mad Max Fury Road. Somebody says they, they had heard that. I actually don't know what iClone is. What is iClone? Do you know? I have not used it. Hmm. When is Avatar 2 going to be released? Uh, I have no idea. I think that there's a release dates on, online, but they're doing they're shooting them all at the same time. Which Isn't is cool. that the, I think that's, it's either the end of this year or the end of next year. And then they're making. Yeah, so many things four. have been pushed. But yeah, I think it's two, three, four, five. Yeah. All at the same time, which is insane to me. That's so. Totally cuckoo. To be able to, I mean, maybe, I mean, it's definitely an immense amount of work. I was just checking myself. Like, is it, would that be like making all of the Game of Thrones seasons at one time. Yeah. Me. <laughs> kind of like that, like having to do it all at once. This tail's way too long. If it was moving around, would it look that long? Cool. You're getting a scavenger vibe from this design. Yeah, that's definitely coming from this face, I think. From this face and like the boniness probably of some of what's going on in here. That's so intentional. I, I realize that I'm kind of also doing a little uh, Kong Skull Island Skull crawler vibe. Did you, did you see that one? The, the newer Kong? Uh, Skull Island, I saw. It was cool. Well, I, I thought it was good. I'm looking forward to the next one. Uh, this, somebody says into 2022 is when okay. Avatar is coming out. Yeah, that's craziness. Right. Well, so it looks I'm like sure you've got be some maybe. texture on a couple different areas. Oh, yeah. Uh, so it looks like you got some texture on multiple surfaces now. Yeah. And then uh, the nice thing with MASH is like, you know, you can add or delete, like, you know, these little rocks at any time. So I can hit the delete brush and delete some of them, the nudge brush, and mm -hmm. I can like scoot them around. So I can like actually move that rock's position. Well, with particle instancing, like you wouldn't be able to just grab a particle and move it like that, which is right. pretty cool. And then obviously you've got scale, move, rotate. So if I want this little rock here to be, you know, bigger, then you actually can do stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So, but yeah, now that I've got like a general block out of stuff, I'm just going to sort of set dress it. Cool. What do you, when you get into set dressing, that's like a lot of the rocks. Are you looking for other things in there or, or how do you, what's rocks, like your approach plants, for that? Rocks, plants, trees, stuff, you know, I think, uh, 
so because that's where you know before i would try and fix the textures like on the ground for example i'd want to get any rocks plants trees in there to see what parts of the ground i'm still even seeing you know because mm -hmm. it might get so covered in stuff that you might not even sort of see it as much anymore mm -hmm. I think I'm somewhat happy with this silhouette as to, to keep moving on. Tail might be a little long. Oh, that looks really cool. Like that. This is pure perspective, but I think it's getting there. Probably focus on this area for the rest of the stream. Just kind of figure out what all this is going to be. And uh, we'll move forward. Enhance. Did you just say enhance? I did. Yeah, thank you for <laughs> catching my reference. 42 to 36. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I mean, I, I knew using that reference, you would definitely catch it. We talked about it last uh, week. With, you said Blade Runner was one of your big influences or one of your favorite movies. Oh, by far, yeah. I mean, I could watch that over and over and over and over. You probably I have. have. <laughs> What's... The, did we ask last week what's the movie you've seen the most ever? I think we talked about which one you've seen in theater the most. Mm, I mean, in theaters, the most Star Wars, the original one when I was a kid. My parents had to take me to that over and over. Um, I was a big Star Wars kid. So I still have all my action figures from the 70s. Oh, wow. Well. I gave him the griffin when he turned five. I felt like he was old enough that they wouldn't all get eaten or destroyed. Mm. So I actually sure. have like photos of me like giving Griffin my uh, action figures. And now nice. they're all over the place. <laughs> so some are here, some are at his mom's, some are <laughs> under couches, some have disappeared. Yeah. Well, that's what happens when you give a five year old place. Yeah. It was hard to wait five years. <laughs> you know, I'm sure. But... I want to give this to you now. Yeah. Sketching through what some of these shapes could be. Kind of don't want it to be very bird like. Do I... Maybe I want to try to like do not eyes. I've really mapped out where these eyes could be, but maybe something that's. Get them. What do I think of the new Star Wars movies? You know, I like the new Star Wars movies, meaning like the recent ones, not the prequels. The prequels were hard. <laughs> that was tough. <laughs> that was a the dark huge time. Bummer. Oh man. Yeah, yeah. What was the first? What was the first moment of the? I remember being in line, and the, watching, to, you know, and watching Phantom Menace, mm -hmm. and the first moment that I was like, "Oh no!" Because I remember <laughs> yeah. the trailer, and I well, I loved like I think everybody probably loved the trailer. It was great. People were hyped. People got there. People were ready to go to go to the movies, and then. There was just a certain moment where it was like, oh, no. Like, I mean, I haven't watched them, you know, in a long time, because I would say I've only seen the prequels, you know, once each because sure. I couldn't watch them again. So it's hard to remember <laughs> what of the many things about those movies that I didn't like made me yeah. realize in the first one. I mean, Roger Roger from the robots. Yeah. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. 
you know, Jar Jar, obviously. Um, just, I don't know. I There were so many things. The acting, the kid was, you know, like just so much bad acting out of good actors too. I yeah. don't know. I think the whole thing was just a, they got better, but sure. uh, yeah, I don't know. What about you? It was the opening crawl, the opening text crawl, when it was all about the Trade Federation and <laughs> yeah. their like the the supposed like you know agreements that was happening. Mm-hmm. I was like, wait, what? Why is why are we talking about Trade Federation and like peace treaties right now? This is not what I expected at all in this trailer, especially. That was that was the first thing that kind of put the the little question mark over my head of hmm? let's see is there one this is a good question for you is there one like big movie big vfx movie that you've never seen everybody's probably got the one where it's like you know what i've actually never seen star wars i've never seen whatever do you have one that you've never seen um i'm well i'm sure but uh it's hard to say off the top of your head head. yeah i mean it's like i've i have definitely seen many so i think that uh because you know with with effects movies popcorn movies like i don't mind if they're silly or or cheesy if like they're just fun to watch you know and so Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, the other night I was just felt like watching something that wasn't like a bucket list movie, just something to just watch something mindless. And I put the new Independence Day movie on. Mm. I was like, yeah, you know, entertaining, sure, silly, ridiculous, but enjoyed it. So, yeah, it's like, that's the funny thing. Like, there's some effects movies that really are really dumb stories but they're still entertaining i think star Mm -hmm. wars was hard because it just had too much meaning to me as like a kid and all that stuff that it was hard Mm -hmm. for me to you know accept it yeah i get that um i'm trying to think of one that i haven't seen that everybody else has seen try to keep up on most of the big ones Seems like you do too. Mm-hmm. If something is big and everybody's seen it, I kind of want to. I kind of want to see it and know what they're all talking about. Uh, where you studied? If uh, I the question from is you know where did you study VFX? I think. Uh, I am a Noman alumni, so I graduated from Noman in 2009. Uh, do we ever do portfolio reviews? Not on this stream, and we don't really do portfolio reviews on any of our streams, but um, if you are looking for one, you can reach out to our admissions team, and they do portfolio reviews. And they also, we have a YouTube video, uh, which is in our playlists of, port- I think it's called Portfolio portfolio tips and tricks and so you can watch that uh, which is with our admissions director where she talks about all the things Noman portfolios admission portfolios uh, that could be helpful for you as well so look at those question that's come up a couple of times do we know whether high school summer camp is going to happen this year or not probably a little hard to call right now so it's uh, it is hard I mean I would say on campus summer camp in June, I'm going to say no. Yeah. Yeah, unfortunately. I mean, it's it's a huge bummer because we really, really loved doing the summer camp program. But uh, things right now are so up in the air with COVID that uh, even yeah. though the vaccines are coming and that's awesome and there is a light at the end of the tunnel, you know, June is only, you know, four months away and we already need to be, you know, getting the word out and booking it. And, you know, we're still not even on campus. So I think, unfortunately, you know, you don't know if there's going to be another wave with COVID. So Mm -hmm. I I think it won't be happening on campus in June, unfortunately. Uh, 
Bummer, but it is what it is. I think it's everybody's dealing with the same thing. So, just in in general, live live of events and in person things are really difficult to to calculate. I, you know, I'm hearing rumors that even Comic Con will already be you know virtual again. So we'll have to see what happens, but soon, as soon as, soon as we can. All right, I'm going to paint some of this cattail grass Ooh. into the scene. Oh, okay, so you found? Did you find one and you're painting it, or? I I had, you know, I've got a bunch of plants, uh, shelves okay. full of plants. So this is something I think I made in Speed Tree, and then I made a mash node out of it. I created a placer node, got the placer node to randomize the rotation in Y, and. Uh, now I'm just going to test it. All right, so I can see it's painting it. And so I think I'm just going to lower the spacing down. So cool. A couple questions while you are painting those plants. Um, do we have reference about the forms we're working on? I think Alex is just kind of making stuff up as he goes. I'm using the Reign of Fire Dragons in a monster from a uh, monster hunter called the Berioth, which is sort of like a Quetzalcoatl wyvern style uh, creature. Um, are there individual classes at Nomen about learning characters in ZBrush? Yes, there are. Uh, all of our classes are online as well right now. So if you uh, head over to our website, you can find those. But you would want to be looking for uh, Intro to ZBrush. If you don't know ZBrush, you could look for Character Modeling and Sculpting, which will also include Maya as well. Uh, and there's a couple others in there that you could look at. Uh, what is the average age of students at Nomen? Uh, generally, I'd say early 20s. You know, 21, 22, 23. I think is the average age, but our yeah. students range from you know 19 to people in their 50s because we have so many uh, continuing ed students, you know, adults, uh, a lot of industry artists. I think we have mm -hmm. over 250 industry artists this term from yeah. tons of major studios that uh, are taking classes. So if you take a class at Nomen, like you you know we mix our population so the full-time students are mixed with the continuing ed population so you would very likely have a class with an industry person mm -hmm. which is cool yeah absolutely so, yeah so those people will be older you know but the full-time students like in the in, in the bfa or in the uh digital production program are often you know in their 20s yep. um have you worked on any movies? I guess we didn't really do intros. We don't really do intros or who we are aside from, you know, that we work at Nomen. Uh, and that's really it. Uh, yes, we have both worked on movies. Um, Alex, you worked on, I remember we were talking about Avatar earlier, but you worked on Avatar. Uh, yeah, I was in the art department for six yeah. months, which was really, really, really fun. It was awesome. It was so cool. Got to share an office with Neville Page, which was really, really cool. And yeah. A lot of fun. Discovered Nespresso. He was really into Nespresso at the time. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, that was doing, like, creature work. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, um, but, you know, I've, my career has mostly been Nomen, to be honest. You know, so I've I've been lucky enough to work on you know some uh projects you know freelance since more in the earlier days of nomen but uh, these days mm -hmm. i am predominantly focused on this on the school and and that's okay because you know we have over 85 teachers and they all work in production and nomen is very much not about me it's very much about the amazing you know teachers that right. we have and their work experience and where they're working um but yeah 
Uh, and then I'll just share my screen because it's easier to show my art station. Uh, my name is Josh, in case you didn't know, because we don't have titles on, our, on us. <laughs> but uh, I'm, I worked at, graduated from Noman. I worked at a place called Legacy Effects, which is a practical effects house uh, formerly known as Stan Winston's. And then I worked at Naughty Dog, and then I worked at Marvel Studios, and then I worked at Cloud Imperium Games uh, over the course of 10 years, all of there. So you'll see things from Real Steel, sees things from many MCU. Uh, thank you for the follow. <laughs> uh, Real Steel, you'll see uh, Avengers, you'll see Iron Man, you'll see Guardians of the Galaxy, you'll see uh, Cloud Imperium stuff as well. So yes, we have both worked on movies and uh, have kind of a range of experiences from creatures to art departments to games to all different kinds of things. Uh, so absolutely. What do we think of well, two questions? One that came in and they said, are you saying it's too late to enter the industry at 45 years of age? No, absolutely not. Uh, we've, I think we've had many grads. You, you said a couple within the past couple of years who are over the age or around the age of 50. We had, uh, yeah, like, uh, I think it's probably like four years ago, we had a couple of grads who were in their mid fifties. Um, so yeah, our full-time student population, like the, the age range is quite, quite varied. And so it's it's yeah. never too late, and we have you know lots of students in the continue ed, continuing ed population that are over forty that are trying to get into the industry. Um, it's never too late, you know. I mean, my best friend from high school, um, who worked at Noman years ago, he was running the Noman workshop. At thirty eight, he uh, told me he wanted to go grab dinner, and uh, he told me he was going to become a lawyer. At thirty eight, with three kids. Had never expressed any interest. I mean, I've known him since I was twelve. <laughs> never expressed any interest in law, and uh, at thirty-eight, went to law school, and he's now a lawyer. And you know, yeah. law school. All of his classmates, for the most part, were in their early twenties. And uh, while mm -hmm. he's, you know, his his wife was working, so she was able to, you know, uh, pay the bills. So he had to not only deal with school, but also childcare. Right. Um, because she was working and uh, and he got through it. So I think uh, it's never too late. It's you have to just have the passion if the passion is there. Mm -hmm. That's everything. absolutely. Uh, somebody's asking. Well, we've got another question from the same person. Uh, Terzone is asking, what do you think of Chris Costa's work with all hand painted stuff? Uh, Chris, is I love awesome. Chris Costa. Yeah, I've he's got Chris incredible for a work. Long time. And uh, uh, yeah, we brought him to Australia for an event uh, a couple of years ago. So I got to spend, uh, you know, over a week hanging out with uh, him and his wife, Jessica. And uh, he is a methodical dude, you know, but, you know, he's, you know, lead, you know, creature modeler at ILM. And when you're working at that level with full screen creatures at 4K where you need to be able to zoom in on one of the creature's toes and it needs to hold up. I mean, there's a level of detail and patience that's required for that kind of work where you're not gonna just bang out a model in a day. You might work on a model or a sculpt for you know a month or two or three, but not to yeah. mention all the revisions. And uh, he's, he's got that sort of Zen approach to letting things take the time they need to take. Um, and yeah, he's, uh, I don't think I could do what he does. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's so impressive. He's so talented and such a nice guy. Yeah. He's awesome. I love his work. I've been following him for a really long time. A uh, couple questions. Are there any physical sculpting classes available? Yes, there are. And then another question, which will change into, and I'm going to share my screen and jump over actually to our website. You can always head over to noma.edu to find this. But they're asking what our foundation in art and design program is for. Uh, this program is is to build a foundation in art and design. Uh, so this is sort of a you know a, focuses more on analog skills. So it's a one year long program, uh, and it's built to help you build a portfolio. Uh, this, we also can refer this to artists who they want to come to Noman, but maybe they don't have a, the, their portfolio together yet, or they're still working on it, uh, this is something that would be a good fit for them. So you could go all the way from you know learning Photoshop, life drawing, perspective classes, uh, traditional clay sculpture classes, so kind of what you were just talking about or asking about, digital painting classes, animal drawing, color theory, uh, all the way through you know environment design, 
creatures and mechs. So uh, kind of a full scope over a whole year to build your portfolio, build your visual language, uh, and start your start like building those foundational skills. So, so that's really what, what that program is for. Uh, a lot of our, our students who take that program uh, end up taking a full-time program afterwards as well and using it kind of as a, a jumping off point to, you know, to get into the arts if they hadn't before. Somebody is saying, you know, was asking about the physical sculpting classes and that the John Brown, who's our clay uh, sculpture teacher, really good, but you, it is a time consuming class. He expects you to put in the effort, absolutely. I think it just kind of shows you, you know, sculpting in clay is, it's difficult. It's really difficult. I mean, it's, it, it also forces you to think differently, which is, I think, one of the best parts about that class for somebody who wants to maybe sculpt digitally or has been sculpting digitally uh, that class will teach you how to look at things when you when you deal with something in your hands it does make you look at it a little uh, different right mm -hmm. i mean sculpting i think is you know what's it's we've been teaching sculpting at Noman since 98 so john has been teaching at Noman for over 20 years and uh you know and john's background is you know the creature makeup effects world and mm -hmm. uh and so we've had it since long before even teaching zbrush because it was clear that for a lot of people who didn't have a background or a very strong background drawing that uh that sculpture was a more accessible way to get into studying anatomy and studying form and for a lot of people it just clicked better and mm -hmm. uh and john's been teaching ever since and it's just it's the nice thing is that it allows you to learn form and anatomy and think about shapes that uh without having to deal with software and the computer and Noman students are already absorbing and learning so many tools that it's kind of nice to have something that is fully complementary to what you're going to do in the computer sculpting is sculpting mm -hmm. You know, and so I think that's where uh, there's a, there's a very simple correlation between the two. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And so I find that if you can sculpt something in clay, you're going to be able to sculpt something in ZBrush. Mm -hmm. um, that's where you know you see traditional sculptors like you know Rick Baker or people at Sideshow, people at uh, you know General Giant who were clay sculptors and then picked up ZBrush and were already doing amazing work. Um, or, or start doing amazing work very, very quickly because of the fact that they know how to sculpt. They understand shape, design, and form. It's just learning the tool. So yeah. I think sculpture is uh, really, really a great way for people to get into Absolutely. Yes. 3D. You know, it, it is a 3D medium, even though it's not technical software. And the cool thing with photogrammetry is you can now sculpt something in clay and scan it and then bring it in the yeah. ZBrush and keep working on it, mm -hmm. which a lot of people are doing because it's, it's a really fun way to work. Yeah. It's it's like the way of, you know, you, you've seen concept artists or traditional artists who do this, you know, or especially comic book artists doing pencils and then scanning in pencils and then inking digital. To me, it's very similar to that mm -hmm. of, you know, blocking something out with your hands because you can do it anywhere, right? You could bring like, you could go to the park and sculpt something like a little head or a little, you know, and then bring it in. I think there's an interesting thing there. I think that's cool. Just so much more tangible too. Uh, there is no, there was a question about the foundation or follow up question about the foundation program. Uh, you can join if you have no art skill, there's no portfolio requirement for the foundation program. So if you're interested uh, in kind of starting, uh, you're going to reach out to our admissions team and have a conversation with them and say you're interested in, in the foundation and art and design program. Yeah, I mean, we added foundation because there were, you know, we were getting a lot of students who were applying to Doman who weren't getting in uh, and needed to work on their portfolio. And so, but we didn't really have something specifically to point them to. So the nice thing with the foundation is that it's a structured year where for a lot of students who are interested in art and interested in learning about effects or games or animation, um, 
you know, it gives them a, you know, structured program, you know, that offers the time and discipline and direction and mentorship that people need. Because a lot of people who are out of, coming out of high school haven't had a lot of art classes in high school. They've been drawing mm -hmm. more as a hobby. And if you go to a very academic high school, you don't necessarily have the time for art, even though you really have the potential. And so the foundation program gives people the opportunity to spend, you know, six months to a year focusing full time, you know, 40 plus hours a week on art. And very quickly, we can see if, if people have the, if that potential is there, you know, mm -hmm. that if they have the ability to focus on their observation skills and to have, you know, patience to go in line with their um, passion and interest. Mm -hmm. So, and we tried to make it as affordable as we could, you know, so the in, entire year of foundation is um, relatively inexpensive. A great program. So I, I think it's perfect for somebody. Grass. Ooh, okay. Let's check out the grass. So, well, I had my clumps, and so now mm -hmm. I've imported like uh, a mesh that just has a whole bunch of strands of grass. That's what's mm -hmm. inside here in my outliner. So I made another mesh node. So now when I'm painting, it's just like single strands instead of clumps. Mm -hmm. So it's this kind of stuff that really kind of makes the texture that you have on your ground matter less and less because it's getting more and more covered by stuff. Makes sense. As you can see, if I zoom in a little bit, that now like the ground, the, the dirt and mud that was like on the ground inside here is getting blocked by a lot of grass and plants. Mm -hmm. so I'm just going to look around and see where else I might need to paint some, probably on this rock on the right and figuring out what areas to polish it seems like yeah somebody had a question for me about the most concept art i created for a single project um that would probably be star citizen i worked on that project for three years and so that was likely the one that would have the most for a single project um outside of that Guardians of the Galaxy, very likely. That one had a lot of background stuff and it was a newer IP. And so they kind of needed, you know, background characters and aliens and random costumes and stuff like that. So a, a range of things. Uh, let's see. What video games do you enjoy playing or watching? We talked about this last stream as well, but. Uh, I like a whole range of games and I like a whole range of films. So, but I do have kind of a sweet spot for, you know, soft spot for action movies, big blockbuster movies, sci fi movies, and fantasy movies. Um, and I really like RPGs and, and RPGs and RTS like strategy games and gaming. Yeah, RPGs for me, for sure. holding down the control key as I drag now, which is uh, adjusting the scale on the grass. That's a nice thing with the uh, mash. If you hold down control, you can actually scale up or down anything you've already painted. That's cool. I know that. Yeah, so I'm just shortening some of the grass that's on this little rock back here. Tablet, would you recommend for beginner and professional to use in the industry? Uh, I would probably have two different choices there. Uh, beginner, I think any of the Wacom or there's there's more um, brands now, but just like a, a basic tablet if you're interested in getting into uh, digital art, like a, a bamboo is like one of the, the Wacom entry line 
or was, I think, the entry line for a while. I would recommend that. It's a good starting point. Um, for professionals, that's when you can get into the higher range stuff, whether you want to use a Cintiq, whether you want to use a Intuos. You know, those are probably the standards. Those are pretty solid. So, yeah, either way. Uh, in the sculpting class, there's a, one other kind of follow-up question for that, uh, asking about learning anatomy from characters. Uh, you'll learn a lot about anatomy. It's not specifically an anatomy class. You don't have to take gesture drawing and other classes, I don't think, to, to take the sculpture class first. Uh, but you you learn a lot about anatomy just because you'll be sculpting a human figure. And so through doing that, you you kind of pick up and, and are forced to evaluate what the forms of the human figure are. And so it may not be an anatomy class in the way of you're going to learn every muscle, but you'll learn what the shapes that those muscles make and, and how to identify them and and then you know, hopefully how to sculpt them as well. So it any realistically any sculpting class, especially if it's human figures, uh, is going to be heavily anatomy focused because it's one of the foundational tools for for making figures, and that's why in that foundation program there's there's uh, figure drawing classes and gesture drawing classes as well. So you kind of round that out. Did you watch, somebody's asking, Johnny Boy from Twitch is asking, sorry, Johnny Boy is asking from Twitch, uh, what did you think of Raised by Wolves? Did you watch that show? Uh, I've only seen the pilot, which was rad. Okay. Uh, it was crazy, so I still need to keep going, but uh, I, yeah. I really, really dug that. You should finish it so we can talk about it, because <laughs> I have thoughts about that show, but I don't want to I don't want to talk about it unless you've you've seen the whole thing. So people are saying they really liked it. Yeah, I, I definitely was blown away by the pilot. I was just like, oh my god. There was, yeah, uh, I mean, I just love his world building. Yeah, for so sure. So cool. He says they also think it's amazing, but they haven't seen the last three episodes either. So no spoilers, please, in the chat. No spoilers for anything we talk about, unless it's a movie that's older, much older. Show or game. Pace, intensity of working in the industry, wondering about burnout, long-term satisfaction. Uh, I mean, I think Josh and I know a lot of people who have been in the industry for you know, 20, 30 years who are still in it and love what they do. I think it, it gets back to really, really making sure that this is what you really, really want to do. It is any art related field is uh, tough because you keep having to learn, you keep having to get better, you you know, new tools keep coming out. Um, but if for you, that's what you would be doing anyway, because you love it so much that it's something that you just uh, can't picture yourself not doing, then what choice do you have? You know, I think that for me and a lot of my friends, um, it's it's about you know what else would you do you know uh the fact that you have the opportunity to have a creative life and be an artist that's a professional that's being paid to do that um there's so many more opportunities today for people that are artists than there were 30 years ago where if you like to draw or you were interested in fantasy or sci-fi you know your options were what you know comic books or illustration book covers um but you didn't really have the entertainment industry exploding like it has over the last 40 years. And so I think ultimately it depends on the studio. There are a lot of studios that, you know, especially bigger ones that are established that um, are able to have very well-designed pipelines and time management so that people can work a 40 hour week, mm -hmm. you know, 
Um, but then you have smaller studios or startups that uh, are, you know, less experienced from a management HR perspective, and uh, the hours can get a little long. Um, so I think you have to sort of choose where you work uh, based on that perception too, you know, and uh, also work in a city where there are a lot of opportunities. I think that uh, that's something that people need to seriously consider is, you know, are you living in a city where you have choice? Because if you don't have choice where you live, you might feel stuck at like the only studio in town that might have hours that are too long. Um, but if you live in a city, um, you know, like LA and Vancouver, Montreal, uh, London, um, Melbourne, like, you know, hotspots for the visual effects or games industries where there are multiple studios, you'll, you'll feel uh, more able to leave a studio you don't like and go to another one. Mm -hmm. You know, so I think that's something that uh, with our field, it is something very much worth considering, you know, is, is your location. But uh, so, yeah, I would say that I know a lot of people who work long hours um, for sure. Freelancers can work a lot long hours because you're always working because you're at home mm -hmm. and you might take on too many clients. Um, a lot of people are, like the idea of like, oh, I want to start my own studio and don't quite realize how much work, work is involved in something like that. Yeah. But there's a lot of other fields that have long hours too. You know, if you're doctors, lawyers, engineers, you know, people that are at, at you know, the, the height of their respective industries um, mm. are going to work long hours too because they're so passionate about what they're working on you know, and, or they're the demands of the job. So this is not a, that's, this is not an easy industry for sure. Mm. But it's pretty damn cool. Agreed. Yeah, exactly. I'm, uh, I feel like I'm making some decent progress on this thing. I kind of sculpted on this head for a little while in this neck. So kind of going from, uh, here, this is where I am now. Welding some stuff together. Getting some creaturey, sculpturey vibes, which is kind of funny. I always like going back. This is what I started with. This is my. I love going to the first save in ZBrush. Like the ZBrush is so one of the coolest things about it for me is you can load all the tools at the same time, and then you can pop back and forth between them. And so this was my first save, and then this is where I am now. So you can kind of see like all of the little individual pieces that I was working on, like, oh, here's, you know, this piece and this piece and this piece and this piece, etc. And then you can kind of see the before and after. I also use this as a design option too. So like if I have one that I kind of just want to see the difference between, I can kind of compare that as well. I'm getting, I did this little like rough sculpt of like feathery, spiky things in here. And I think that's setting a little bit of a tone that I like for what I would want to have sort of like a theme, like a, sh a shape theme here. I'm, I'm starting to enjoy this one. I'm, I'm, I was pretty worried about it when I was looking back at the, when I was at this stage, I was like, this is, this is not going well. <laughs> Sometimes you sculpt something or you work on something and you're like, mm -mm, nope, this is going to need way more time. Or uh, this is, this one isn't going the way that I hoped. But it, it's turning around, so I'm beginning to actually enjoy it now, which is good. Nice. Yeah, it's a little <clears throat> unnerving to just, uh, since I haven't done much of this, to just start with a blank scene without a plan. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, how much, the question from, the, from W. Really and Twitch is saying, uh, how much time does the usual concept art development phase take? Uh, that's an interesting and broad question. If it's overall concept, I think you're kind of talking about the general idea of pre-production. Pre-production can take months or years, depending on the project itself. Uh, if you're looking at something like, if you're asking about a specific uh, character, that also can take months or years. For example, if you're working on a character who's the hero of, of, a, of a property, that may take you know, six months to finalize what all the character, that character looks like, what all their costumes look like, etc. If you're talking about one individual design for one of those, 
usually no longer than two days, maybe three, four days, if it's really complex or really getting to final final designs, uh, is, is kind of what you're looking at for uh, one piece of concept art. And that doesn't, you know, that's it depends as well on what the deliverables are, what the needs are for the pipeline itself or for the, the thing itself. It's always the cop out answer if it depends on the project, but it's so true. Like it really does depend on on what's needed for that project. I mean, I would say that the <clears throat> scale and budget often yeah. is going to determine how much is w w riding on that being successful and how much time I might go into it. And the director is going to have a big say on that. So, mm -hmm. you know, Avatar, the art department's been working on that, you know, the sequels for years already, you know, yeah, full-time art exactly. department. Um, just, you know, Avatar 1, you had concept artists that were on the movie for, you know, several years. Um, because things continue continually needed to get designed and it's massive world building but if you're talking about mm -hmm. being a concept artist working in commercials where there's a commercial that's got a four-week deadline and it has a creature in it you know the yeah. concept art phase for the creature in that commercial might be two days yeah exactly really depends jump over here let's see all right i ended up rotating these wings so they were more in line with those elbows and all of a sudden it made it a very different profile but i think it's starting to come together a little stronger i do need to start focusing on some of the actual shapes like i did in here though like this is very unfinished i don't really even know how this anatomy would work If I was doing this for like a project, would I, you know, I might submit a first pass that still kind of looks like this, but at a certain point, I would really need to go in and um, put some reference. Like, what is, what is, you know, an animal anatomy like this? What would it look like? What could it look look like? And that's probably where I would invest a little bit of time is figuring out what the next. How to make this resolved, basically. How do I make this a little better than it is? And just the way that I work, which is I like to get my first shot out there and see what it looks like and see what the response is, and, you know, especially if it's for production. Sometimes I'll have a lot of reference if it's specific to what the job is, but um, and then adjust afterwards. What you can see I'm doing in these arms for is uh, I'm taking these rough shapes and I'm basically creating extra planes, uh, extra forms within these shapes. So it's kind of going from a more blobby rough shape to defining more specifics of what anatomy, muscle, bone uh, is going on in there. And that's kind of a, a key part for my process to really start defining uh, what the difference in things are.
Uh, somebody's asking about when I was studying at Noman, where did I live? Uh, I lived in Hollywood. I actually lived very close, probably two, three blocks away uh, in LA. I lived in an area called Larchmont uh, for the bulk of the time I was going to Noman. I also lived in Burbank for a little while when I first moved to Los Angeles. They're asking about how do you manage your costs. Uh, their financial aid is available, so you can uh, get loans for, for that, and that was the way that I, I did that. But I found that living as close to the school as possible was really important for me because that way I could spend more time there. So I ended up living as close as I could and then mostly would bike in every day um, to be in the labs, basically, to work, hang out with friends, and projects. Idea. I'm making this up and I probably shouldn't, but I'm making this up <laughs> where this would connect and what these shapes would be. I'm really just looking for appealing ish shapes here. Uh, somebody looks like they've already answered the question, but yeah, the individual classes are all exactly the same as the normal classes. It's the same population of students. So if you take an individual class, you'll likely be taking a uh, class with full-time program students uh, and even you know professionals who are taking the classes as well. So they're all exactly the same. We don't split them up. What helped my speed improve in designing? Oh, that's a good question. I don't know. I don't know if I ever really thought about what made my speed improve. Um, time. I think. I think a lot of it is just time. Uh, doing projects over and over and over. Uh, just getting more comfortable. I think as you, the longer you work, you start like creating these. Um, like the easiest analogy that I would have, like if I was teaching this, is is a recipe. Like the first time you, like if you're cooking, the first time you've ever cooked something, it's a challenge, right? You're always referring back to the recipe that you, you know, got to look at the book. How many cups? How many tablespoons? You know, what's the ingredient? What goes in first? How long do I let this? you know, bake or saute for, right? Like the first time you do any of that, it's really challenging. And then once you've made it two, three, four, five, six, ten 10 times, if it's something you make a lot, you can start to kind of do it a little bit more um, without having to refer. And at a certain point, you can make the recipe without picking up the book or the app or whatever. And so for me, it kind of turns down to the amount of projects you've done, the amount of mileage you've done, each one of each time you do one, it, it adds like another page to your own sort of cookbook of, of whether it's sculpting or designs or things you've made. And so when you go back to to make another one, you're kind of pulling from that that book of things that you've done or things that you like. And sometimes it's not just the things you've done, but it's also like your influences or your your things that you really care about or you research or you know, those are other things that can kind of add to that. So putting in the mileage is a big part of it. 
Um, the other thing that I think has actually helped my speed quite a bit, and it's it feels backwards, but is I work slower than I used to work, meaning like I actually sculpt slower. So I'm not going up to high levels in subdivisions very fast and beginning to sculpt. I'm not physically trying to move as fast as possible, like, you know, seizure alert. But if like I start trying to sculpt and like you know, on constantly moving around and, and trying to get this thing to to be on as fast as possible that is actually very destructive in the way that i work it doesn't it doesn't work for me so for me it's actually slowing down and trying to make every move intentional so what is the point of you know me making these adjustments why am i doing that every every move i do every not every but that's the the goal right is that every stroke every addition every subtract subtraction that i make in a design or a sculpture is intended to make the final result better rather than just noodling um and i think that's actually one thing that you see with like some of the old painters and masters is that their brush strokes were so intentional like you can see them right you can always see their a lot of their brush strokes and they clearly knew what they wanted and they were just doing enough to communicate that and not trying to spend too much time in other areas. So mileage, time, and then being more intentional and kind of evaluating what you're what you're spending your time on and why are the are the, probably the big two things that help with the that help with speed. At least for me, I don't know, Alex, if you've got any comments on you know, getting faster in your workflow or if that's even important? Getting faster in your workflow? Yeah, like in, in making stuff. Like, Yeah, I mean, I think that uh, speed, the, the faster that you can work, the more fun you're going to have. And so that's where spending time thinking about your workflow is important. And so being organized, you know, I mean, obviously you, you want to start with knowing your software. Um, very well. So that at the beginning is going to slow you down, but eventually you're going to get to the point that you're comfortable with your software and then you're going to want to continue to see what you can do to organize. So if you're, you know, um, a texture artist having an organized texture library where you know where things are, you know, uh, having an organized reference library so you know where you can find good reference for what you need. Um, if you're an environment artist having you know, rocks and plants and all that kind of stuff that you've already made that are ready to sort of be repurposed in different projects. Um, uh, anything, you know, like the fact that I have all my shelves, you know, is a time-saving thing. So like I can click, you know, a button and import a plane that has 50 subdivisions already so I can start sculpting on it for like some of these ground surfaces as opposed to mm -hmm. going to create polygons plane creating it and increasing the subdivisions to 50 you know and then working so i think uh just trying to figure out ways that you can speed up your your workflow is going to be really useful like a lot of the things that i have on my shelves are ultimately going to be stand-ins for things that will be replaced like if i was working on an illustration for myself um i may not want this character to be in here i might replace it with my own character but at least i have a stand-in that I can use, mm -hmm. you know, I can look at this scene and be like, all right, well, you know, I want to put a cave entrance, you know, here on the left. So now I'm going to have to, you know, replace this piece of geometry that, that's on the left, but at least I have a stand in that I can then, you know, use to just block out what's going on. So, but knowing your software is probably the first one. Hotkeys mm -hmm. are great. Mm -hmm. You know, I can speed things up quite a bit. I'm a big hotkey fan. Love hotkeys. Do you mark? Do you use marking menus? Not as much as I used to. I used to use them like a maniac. Yeah, I used to like some of them, but even I, I customized all my Maya stuff to be modeling tool centric, and you know, replacing tons of hotkeys that are already existing with you know, tools I would use in Maya or, or you know, modeling stuff. So I think customizing and getting used to your own workflow is a big, big part of that as well.
what do you use a lot? Make sure that you have quick and easy access to that. Say that again. Uh, some. Oh, I was just saying that you know whatever you whatever tools you use that you have quick and easy access to them, which is basically what you've done with all of your shelves. Yeah. Somebody was asking, uh, do you ever use Photoshop for environment illustration, or you just do three D? Um, I don't know for finals. I've I haven't done much environment work in general. Do you use? Have you done much Photoshop for to do a final, or is your stuff most is mostly three D? Mostly three D. Yeah. yeah, a lot of you know, like when I'm finished with something in Maya, or you know, quote finished, getting close, I'll then render out all the passes, go to Photoshop, and do the final illustration there. And a lot's going to change in Photoshop, um, and so I definitely do a lot of post work on 3D renders, which is, which yeah. is very common. Yeah. Yeah. Same. Um couple of questions we got coming in here one is do you sketch first or is it all freestyle i think today we're both just going freestyle uh, uh we, yeah you you've done sketches and stuff before i mean you we you showed off your Octo inktober stuff last stream yeah one of these streams i'm going to stop doing this make start from scratch thing because it's uh you end up getting you i start slowing down because i'm thinking about lighting and composition where if I had a thumbnail first, that would have already mm -hmm. been figured out. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, like if I go, that doesn't need to be running anymore. If I go back out here, I showed this last week, mm -hmm. you know, um, hopefully I'll start on the streams, just picking one of these and being like, all right, maybe I'm going to, you know, do this one today and maybe this one and, you know, like pick a, a, one of my drawings from Inktober and just start making them in 3D. Because like if I today had started with just, you know, let's say like this one, my life actually would have been a lot easier. Yeah. <laughs> because, you know, uh, I, I'd know where I need to put my block out geometry. I'd know where the light needs to be. I'd know where our little character needs to be sitting. And I'm now it's execution, but composition and lighting are done. And so, and you're going to end up with a much better end result if you go this way. And that's how most, you know, professional illustrators will work is, you know, do a bunch of thumbs. I have, you know, some images that I started, that I, you know, with, you know, just playing around to see where I'm going to end up in Maya that I like. But generally, the images of mine I like the most are the ones where I started with a drawing first. Mm -hmm. You know, because I kind of like, I know what this is going to look like in 3D if I, if I make this. You know, but if I start with a blank scene, I don't. I know I know that I can take this drawing and make it better. And that's ultimately what, you know, going from 2D concept art to a 3D render is your job, is to is to finish it. You know, I think that's where a lot of people get conf or, or mix up the idea that 3D artists aren't contributing to design, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, the reality is when you look at, you know, drawings, they don't look photoreal, it's a drawing. But if you're working in film, the end result is going to be photoreal. So to go from a drawing to a final photoreal 3D image uh, requires filling in a lot of gaps that are not in the drawing. And that's where 3D artists have so much creative input. Mm -hmm. And so I think yeah. that there's uh, you know, a lot to be said for the fact that you know, that's why Nomen is an art school. You know, we're not a 3D technical trade Thing. You know, it's like we're an art school. The students who will go to Nomen are artists. And as they work in the industry, they are contributing creatively to the final result, even if you're not a concept artist. You know, and if you go to a studio like, a, you know, a Blizzard or an ILM, like the ILM art department is what, maybe 20 people, 25 people, yeah. but, yeah. but 3,000 people work at ILM. Right. Um, so does that mean that the, only the people in the concept art department are creative? Of course not. So I think that uh, that's where I think there's a lot to be said for the fact that maybe like I don't draw as well as a lot of people, right? Because I have I've spent so much of my uh, professional life as a 3D artist, um, but uh, but I can do 3D renders that look really good, and you know I've learned 3D software to a point that that's how that's my finishing tool. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. But yeah, start starting with a blank thing, and uh, I think it's ZBrush. It's maybe a little easier to start with a blank canvas because you're focusing on an asset. Yeah, exactly. I was going to say, like for me, it's also I don't do many two D sketches because I use three D and ZBrush as my sketching tool. So I'm going to just sketch. For me, it would be no different than picking up clay and mushing clay around to make a rough object, right? That's how I prefer to to kind of explore. So me making this today uh, is, I guess you could say, is freestyling. But I had an idea of what I wanted. There was a suggestion from the stream, as uh, from the chat, as far as what to make, and so I kind of went down that road. I've definitely made uh, things before. I made this thing that had no there was no intention for what whatever this was I made this a couple of streams ago just a creature and i kind of just started making shapes and seeing how the shapes tied together and they ended up being a thing right so this to me is a sketch now if i was going to take it to the next level i would just kind of slowly build on my sketch much like if you've seen uh illustrators or comic artists draw right they might draw in blue pencil and then they'll they'll put an overlay in tracing paper or digital whatever and they'll draw another pass on top of that and then they'll draw another pass on top of that and another till it's final and that's kind of the way that i use i use zbrush and is to kind of treat it almost more like a, a sketching tool where you know i'm working my way even you can see it here but i'm working my way my first blocks of putting together these little blocks of clay and seeing how they play together and then eventually you know working my way from you know here to here to here to where I'm now closer to a more final result, but that's because I'm I'm basically continually sketching uh, up. So it's kind of a different approach, and yeah, it is it is more one asset versus uh, an environment or, or something like that. But I think sketching, if you're doing environments, at least a thumbnail is a good starting point. Um, somebody's asking a question about ergonomics. Do you have any special tips for ergonomics or anything like that? You know, somebody that's spending 40 to 80 hours a week in school and combined with their job, that's what they're saying. Sit back uh, in your chair. Sit back in your chair. Yeah, that definitely helps. And invest in your chair. That's something I would say. Like, there's certain things in your life that you, sh you should invest some of your money in. Uh, what, what is it? Like your your bed and your chair are the yeah. two that I, that I invest a little extra money in because uh, – I, I actually bought this chair. This is a steel case leaf. I bought this chair nine years ago, and it is still holding up shockingly well. Um, I I know we had, you. I think you're a big Herman Mil Miller fan, right? You use Aeron's. Uh, I use Herman Miller. Yeah, so I'm sitting in an Aeron chair. I mean. Aaron chairs last forever, so they're expensive. Yeah. You can buy them refurbished for like five hundred bucks, which is expensive. Mm -hmm. But if you're going to have it for twenty years, you know, like if you amortize that price over, you know, how long those chairs can last, and an Aaron chair can last for twenty years, mm -hmm. then you know it's, uh, you know, not actually costing you all that much money, and it's going to save your back, you know. So. Oh, tons. It's it's Puns. really 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 important to be comfortable. Um, yeah. So for me, it's, I, mean, I think everybody has a different different needs when it comes to to comfort. Mm -hmm. But like I sit where I you know I used to hunch forward a lot. You know, like I used to sit like this at the computer, mm -hmm. and uh, and now I just like you know I'm in the habit of like sitting back and using the chair for what it's meant to do, which is support your back and your lower back. And, uh, you know, thinking about the height of the armrest to the height of the tabletop so that my forearms mm -hmm. are resting on the table. I'm not, like, using my shoulder muscles to keep my arms raised. There's lots of little mm -hmm. things to, to consciously think about, I think. Yeah, I agree. And setting it up, and once you kind of set it up and you're conscious about it, it can be okay. I also take a lot of breaks. So I don't normally work for more than two and a half, three hours without getting up. I also move around in my chair a lot, so I, I, don't, I also sit weird, so I'll often sit like this, which is not good for you, but um, I, I kind of will alternate the way that I sit, kind of get moving. Uh, as far as wrist pain, 
I know a lot of people who you know who have been working for a while will have wrist issues. Uh, what I do is I often rotate. I just rotate between a, a mouse and a a pen very often. I can I can and I don't necessarily love it, but I can sculpt decently with the mouse. Uh, I've kind of developed the ability to do that over time, just because like I'm sculpting with a mouse right now. I'll do it for a little while, but. Um, I find that the, just the rotation angle and what you're doing with your hand um, will will save you over time a little bit of just, just what it really is, is what I think is changing up your routine like that you're not doing the same exact movements uh, over and over and over and over and over and I think that's a big big part of it um, is that's the repetition that ends up hurting you considerably or just sitting there and not moving yeah uh let's see what we got a couple questions as yours is switch to yours as yours is kind of looking like it's getting more resolved i'm playing with different lighting now so I'm just trying different hdrs just to see mm -hmm. if i can uh come up with a different light setup that I like. And so this one's uh, like, you know, that's another thing of being organized. Like I've got, you know, a lot of HDRs from different libraries, but I just merged them all into like one folder so that I can mm -hmm. just browse my HDRs just by going to a single directory instead of like having a million directories to jump around in. Mm -hmm. um, But uh, do I use a Cintiq? I do have a Cintiq. I don't, uh, haven't been using it all that much because I got it pretty recently. And so I've mm -hmm. been using just a regular Intuos mostly. And uh, so I look forward to using the Cintiq more. Uh, I used to have a Cintiq that I used to use a lot and then it's been a while. See the question about your favorite tool album? Uh, Enema. Enema? What did they say theirs was? For oh, sure. same. Full Collapse was my favorite Thursday album. Thank you for referencing my, my emo phase in high school. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, Full Collapse was also my favorite one. Cross at the Eyes. That was my, that was my jam. For sure. Um, let's see what theme somebody's asking what theme that we love the most are you talking about like a musical theme a theme song like a soundtrack like a soundtrack Blade Runner <laughs> <laughs> let's see uh, any um, of our stuff is awesome though Inception soundtrack is amazing. Inceptions is really great. Absolutely. Um, I think Inception is really good. I think if I had to pick like one that's like a franchise, it's really hard to beat the Star Wars opening, like during the crawl, just because I don't know. There's something about it that just like gets me into the zone and gets me excited to watch one of those movies. So that's that's one I quite like. One that's grown on me over time is actually the Avengers and the Marvel soundtrack. For a long time, I didn't really re notice or recognize them, and now it's gotten to the point where I actually really am enjoying them. Mm. John Williams in general. No, he's, that, those aren't John Williams, but John Williams in general is great. Um, what else? Art theme. What's your favorite art theme? Oh, I don't know. Uh, there was a question about uh, working from home. You know, COVID, post-COVID, working from home. Do you think that um, that will open up opportunities to work from more locations? I think it could. I think some things will definitely change. I think you'll see some remote-only studios pop up 
and I think some already have, or you're already seeing that, but I don't know if that will stay forever. Um, I think that some will be around, but I guess my short answer, or my opinion is, some will stay, but there's still gonna be the need to be in person, some of the bigger projects especially, because uh, I find it's much harder to be more creative over um, tool. I like that impromptu moment where you can walk into somebody's office. It's a little harder. It's a bit ball. Yeah, I mean, some studios have said that they're uh, doing very well with the working from home and are going to stay that way. Mm -hmm. And because it does obviously open up who they can hire now that they see that yeah. they can effectively work that way and can hire people from all over the world instead of just sitting focusing on people that are in their city so i think that's a big plus yeah huge so i do think that they're you know that covid is going to create a, a lasting change from that perspective yeah Do you have a personal all-time favorite game console? Hmm. Game console. I mean, I've played so many games on so many consoles that it's more <laughs> of like, what's my favorite, you know, game? Yeah. But, uh, yeah. Although if I really think to my favorite games, they've all been games I've played on a PC. So my favorite. I was gonna game say. Console is a PC. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, if I had to pick a console, I think the one that I like remember the most for me playing a lot of really great games on was PlayStation 2. But I actually really like the Switch. I really like the Switch because of the port, like the portability of it, and just being able to take it anywhere. And they have some really great games on it too. They're not not best looking games always, but they it's so portable and versatile that I, I think that's why it's it's in the conversation for me. If it's not there, it's in it's up there. I'm now bringing some VDBs in here just to get some fog. Oh, nice. Is that something where you're also, you have a shelves of VDBs? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, uh, a couple of years ago, really needed uh, VDBs and was debating, like learning how to make them myself in, but like in Maya, or Houdini. So we had a couple titles released for the workshop, one on how to do VDBs for clouds in Maya and one for how to do VDB or do cloud VDBs in Houdini. So we have those titles in the library that I specifically wanted. And then, uh, but then once, once I, in the process of getting them made, I asked Robbie who was making the VDB on clouds for Houdini, if he could just as part of the title, create a library of VDBs for smoke and clouds that would come with that library. And he did. And so now I just use that. Oh, nice. Um, and so, yeah, so if you if you have a Nomen Workshop subscription and you go to the Houdini Clouds title, there's a download that has a big library of PDBs uh, for cool. smoke and stuff, which is really, really cool. But now I would say with, uh, you know, something like Embergen, you know, once that's kind of at final, I'll probably end up wanting to, uh, start making more of my own since it'll be a, a lot less work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that'd be cool. Edison, since 2010, that's awesome. I know I used to have a lot of DVDs. 
been a while since I've made a new title for the workshop. I feel really guilty about that. <laughs> I really need to get back. I've been so busy with Nomen over the years that it's like I, I really, really uh, miss doing titles for the workshop. Mm -hmm. um, my hope is these streams are gonna, you know, get me back into making stuff. Yeah, there you go. I think that'd be awesome. Nerbs modeling a human. Can you remember that? Oh my god! <laughs> <laughs> I never had to do nerbs modeling you of a human. Do that. You're so lucky. Oh my god! Not as a human. No, I, I did like a car or or like a something. I don't remember. I because that was one of the classes at Nomen that I took like right before nerbs was really going out. Mm -hmm. So I was like, I don't I hate this. Like. I really hated making my, the NURBS stuff. It was the worst. Yeah, NURBS was just really, really, really slow. So, like, especially for characters, because you had to make it like a, Ugh, a patch. NURBS, NURBS patch by default just has four sides, like a, like a plane. And so, to make a character, it would end up being like 500 to 1,000 NURBS patches that then you had to use stitch nodes so that they wouldn't tear apart. And, oi, oi. I mean, at the time, it was just, awesome. At the time, it was amazing because there was no other way to do it, you know. And sure. then uh, Pixar showed Jerry's game, that short where they showed sub yep. for the first time, and everybody was like, "Oh my god, that looks." We want awesome. that. Yeah, give us that. Yeah. And uh, and thank thank God we uh, were able to get away from Nerbs. Indeed. Oh. Oh. Somebody's asking, they, they're saying that uh, there used to be contests in the forums where you gave, gave away a lot of DVDs. Any chance of bringing something like that back? We uh, have a Nomen Workshop contest. It's on Facebook. Okay, yeah. There you go. So go check out the Facebook group or Facebook page for that. So yeah, Nomen Workshop uh, contest is still happening. But yeah, it used to be uh, in the forum. Mm -hmm. All right, we got about 15 minutes left in our stream today. I'm trying to load up my most recent one. Okay, that's good enough. Somebody says there is a contest now or something like that. So that's cool. I loved contests. They were always... They were always a really good um, external deadline, honestly, is the biggest thing that I like them for. Just they're being able to provide like uh, the prizes and stuff are cool. It's always a nice thing to, to try to shoot for. I always liked external contests to push myself for a deadline, for timing, for a different topic, for whatever. I love, love them. Big fan of contests. Even at Nomen, I remember uh, really liking best of term. That was one of the big drivers for me was trying to do to do work for using best of term basically as a contest. Like yeah. Try to complete something in a specific time frame. When was best of term announced? Uh, usually somewhere around the middle end of that term. So it'll be uh, submitted middle of the term and judged mid late of a term. There's no specific date. But I'd say probably next week. Or the next one? Yeah, soon. Next next week. Current one. So, yeah. well, you said you did the first pass, and so we need to go through it together. So, mm -hmm. right. Mm hmm. 
which we can do. I don't know. This after yeah. lunch. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, that's it. So yeah, hope, hopefully next week we can get best of term launched and the new student mm -hmm. reel is almost done. Yeah, that'll be cool. I'm excited for that's getting that. close. That's getting super close. You're all wondering in the student discord. Yeah, it's soon, soon, soon for sure. Trying to put like the last minute finishing touches in mind. So I'm moving quickly, trying to add some plain definition, a couple little, I didn't really get to where the eyes or anything were. That's okay though. But I'll put them here. See, they're up here for some reason. I know I'm not getting best of term, but maybe the student reel. You never know. You just got to keep submitting. I mean, we've been doing best of term for so long. And it's what's fascinating is that I see people in term one that submit, and then I see the same person submit mm -hmm. in term two. And it's cool doing best of term to see how people's work improves over time. And so ultimately, I mean, we've had people in term one win a category before. Mm -hmm. Um, it's rare, but it happens. And so usually, you know, it's upper term students who are winning just because they've been around longer and, the, you know, they've had time for their work to get better. So it kind mm -hmm. of makes sense. Um, but ultimately, I think it's uh, it's been fun to have best of term. It was the same thing like when I was in art school, like getting into the gallery, like they changed the gallery every mm -hmm. semester and like getting a piece in the gallery was just kind of your dream. Mm -hmm. Because that's what made me want to go to that art school was the quality of the work in the gallery and hoping that my work would one day be good enough to be in there. Mm -hmm. So I, I hope the best of term at Noman has that same thing where it's you know it's competitive but in a, hopefully a friendly way because it's mm -hmm. everybody I think at Noman understands that you know we're all on the same team you're all on the same team you're all going to work together in the future all your classmates are going to be your friends at studios that you know are going to be able to help you you know, network and all that stuff. It's like, everybody's on the same team, help each other. I learned so much from my classmates when I was in school. Mm -hmm. Tons. That's Tons. what I miss about campus being open is just students being in the Absolutely. labs, being able to look over each other's shoulders. And I know that, you know, obviously we're making it work with Discord and everything, but I can't wait for campus to be reopened. Yeah. All right, I guess I'm going to do a render. So time to bump up samples. <laughs> I missed a 45 minute drive from Santa Clarita. I wouldn't miss that either. <laughs> uh, yes, none of us miss the driving, that's for sure. But yeah, but you know, it's like I'm I'm such a hermit, and so at the beginning of COVID, it was like, all right, cool, stay home, and you know, that's fine. And it only took like you know three months to go by to realize how social I really am, like how much I miss being around people, like yeah. just I mean, our weekly D and D. Yeah, dude, like that's, yeah. that's, I mean, that was so much fun. We'll have to get back to that at some point. 
I just can't believe it's almost been a year since campus has been closed. No, it's insane. All right, I think I'm pretty much done. We got nine or so minutes left. Well, I'm just doing a 2K render. Ended up just going for a foggy scene. So it's just a dome light with a HDR on it, no directional light. Mm -hmm. And there's definitely a lot of wonky things in here, but. Things to improve, but that's happens when you make something in a couple hours, right? It's like always a good starting point. It's like rare to make something that you really want to be you're really happy with and finished in a couple hours, but there's always the like, okay, I'm ready. I know what I want to fix, and then I can be done with this. Kind of a get you a good starting point. No, this is awesome. I mean, I'm as as long as people are okay watching me work at this pace, you know, hopefully yeah. it's interesting. I mean, it's definitely fun for me. It gets me to stop doing emails. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think it's good. I like it. There's coming together. I'll show them. I don't have a good render here or good pose, but I guess it's probably the ankle ish. This thing will be. I'm just trying to get this arm somewhat. What was before this one? This is earlier. See, he'd look cool in my scene. That's true. Yeah, we have to find a way to get you over there. And get this like we got. We got to get like a bridge to Alex's scene button, and then we'll just pop it right in. Because, yeah, it's like that's the thing is, you know, with uh, if you play with your lighting right, it's OK if the, if the model's not textured. Mm -hmm. I get it uh, in the shadows or in the fog or. I like this like circular. I'm in shape that I ended up with right here. I kind of like that. So maybe we can enhance that a little. It's like a cave dweller because it has underdeveloped eyes. Yeah, I would agree. I agree. I mean, I could do like this. I just couldn't find the right location for them. I mean, that's not terrible. Very skull like, but something in here. Maybe they're just like these little weird things. Maybe they're this is the old, whoop, old eye stock. I'm going to scroll. I don't hate that. I don't know if they oh, Let's see. Da, 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 da. How diverse yeah. is no? Did you answer that? Uh, I didn't see that one. <clears throat> How diverse is Nomen? I would say rather, it's, you know, over the years, I'd say that it's changed. Back in, you know, 25 years ago, we were probably 90% uh, male to female, which wasn't good. Now we're getting closer to 50 50. And I would say, you know, our student population represents everybody. It's awesome. You know, I would say that we have people from all over the world, all over the country, from all different ethnicities and orientations, and we're welcoming of everybody. Our industry is very progressive. And uh, and I think that, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I would say we've got just about everybody covered, which is great. You know, it's like I grew up in L.A. I'm used to being in a diverse culture. You know, mm -hmm. it's like I'm, uh, I obviously come from a mixed background. Let's see how I can yeah, do this. Cool. Where is it? Cam. So, yeah, it's, it's so much better now that we're 50 50. You know, it's like being, you know, over 20 years ago when it was 90% uh, male uh, wasn't great. And, you know, it's hard to understand why that was the ratio of the applicants and the students we were getting. But uh, I think it just makes for a healthier environment to be mixed and diverse and you get different perspectives and it's just it's way better.
Yeah. Somebody was asking what the scale of my creature is, so I'm going to put him in, in this one. Power of 3D. Moving. <laughs> scale of creature made me think of Cloverfield. I need to see that movie again. That was a large creature. Big creature, absolutely. Well, maybe something like, let's get this plane over here. That's not terrible. It's a little smaller. I think it'd be cooler if it was bigger. It's like a Harry Potter sized dragon, I think. That's roughly what these were. I put them. Something in this range could go huge. It's kind of a thing, but I think somewhere in here. Computer is beginning to spin up. It's time to take off. <laughs> it's like, you can hear, I don't know if you can hear it through my mic, but it's like. Yeah, mine has been doing that. <clears throat> but that's just the nature of Redshift and yeah. GPU rendering. I was asking, what is this? Uh, this is another scene that I've been working on. With, we did a stream with Jared Kraszewski using the thick skin features of clay. So we made this piece together. Uh, well, he made his own. I made this one. And then I created a bigger scene for it that could have some other characters or creatures in it. So uh, that's I got to finish this at some point. It was what I was working on last stream. So eventually I'll finish this as well. But yeah. All right, um, we are pretty close to the end here. I'm gonna jump back into my creature. This is not the one I made, I made a different one. Get to our end point. The last one. I think it is. Now I have them all open and I'm trying to figure out which one I did last. Yeah, I think this is last. Yeah, because the little eyes. Or horn things where the eyes could go. This is my last one. I'll leave this up here and I'm just going to save one last time and I'm not going to touch it anymore. Alex, is yours rendering or is yours done? Look at that. It's done. So, I like it. It's just a foggy outdoor scene with a lot of rock. Yeah. So how much of that is... Because obviously, so like you're, you're kind of using your own kits. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of uh, different pieces kind of put together. I mean, aside from everything is stuff that I've made either with speed tree, paint effects, <clears throat> or photogrammetry, except for uh, two mega scans textures that are on that ground plane there. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> this one here, and then this dude obviously is from Render People. Mm -hmm. um, and so I've got a bunch of people that I just downloaded from their site. But uh, eventually, to make my own characters <laughs> yeah right well that's the next phase then well you because you were talking about you know, maybe working on a longer project i think i want to get into a bigger project at some point where i can find a place to put it all in there we were talking about i want to i want to learn unreal i want to maybe use that as like a rendering engine or find a place to start putting things i think that could be fun so yeah yeah I'd, well they would figure love out to. what our next big projects are in the future it's nice to kind of just throw some stuff together here and and create for a couple hours. Yeah, Somebody was saying this would look great in Unreal. So I think knowing Alex, I feel like Unreal would be perfect for you. I think you would really dig it. The medieval village, that was amazing. So I don't know how long it would take from <clears throat> knowing yeah. to being able to do that, though. Yeah, we'll have to see. That'll be part of the adventure. All right. Uh, yes. Thank you, everybody, for joining. It is 1 o'clock now. So from uh, what I ended up doing, my creature here in ZBrush, to Alex's work here, uh, thanks for hanging out with us. 
and sculpting and making stuff and chatting. Appreciate the uh, time from everybody kind of hanging out with us and all the good comments and questions and keeping it lively. I really appreciate that. So thank you very much. Um, that's it for today. We're going to head out and uh, I'm going to play our campus video to just kind of remind us of how much we all miss being there. <laughs> and awesome. Get us hyped up. All right, everyone. Have a good day and have a good stream. We'll see you all soon. Cool. Later. Bye.